Krish, you start. Help you me, I suppose. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So I see more and more people coming. Um, that's good. I think we should start. Um, okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends on where you are. I'm Michael Young from University of Twente in Netherlands. So on behalf of my co-organizers, Hui Zhengxia, Jian Jing, Xuanan, Liang Pichon from Wuhan University, and Shanghai from um, Huazhong University of Science and Technology in China, and Sergi Broni from Cornell Tech, and Ndibu Luo from University of Rochester, and Mihal Dachu from DLR in Germany, and Marshall Palacio uh, from uh, University of Venice in Italy. So on, on behalf of my co-organizers, I, I warmly welcome you to this workshop, Learning to Understand Aerial Images. Okay, let's see if it's working. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly give an introduction for a few minutes, then we can start our program. So in the last decades, so there are large and more amount of data from different kinds of sensors available and largely also publicly available, for example, from satellite imagery, aerial uh, imagery, or UAV imagery. And on the other side, the use of these data are far from being developed. I mean, we all know now, manual interpretation is time consuming. So we know that we need automatic understanding of aerial images. And there are many applications behind these. Yeah, for example, the and first responses and on mapping on the, the visual surveillance and on the others. So I give you a few examples here. And the aerial images, actually they are not uh, from the human centric. Yeah, um, you can mainly for photogrammetry or measurement, remote sensing. And compared to the natural images, they actually the, they have different spectral bands for collens on depth fields and imaging geometry. Yeah. So these all differences actually pose many new issues and challenges to the method on the models and algorithms in computer vision which has been developed and to understand images taken from a human perspective. Okay, so we think that it's time to organize a workshop to discuss the problems for specifically for learning, understanding aerial images. So that's how we come to this program. So we, we start with uh, an invited talk from David Soya on geospatial deep learning that you can query and understand. And then with two oral presentation afterwards, and then we have a small break. And then afterwards we have a second invite talk from Connor Schindler on towards global high resolution biomass maps. And then another two oral um, presentation follows. And the third one, an invited talk from Nishin Dai on all season semantic scene understanding, another two oral presentations. And afterwards, we'll have a presentation on the challenging results and, and awards. So, so, so yeah, please um, keep in mind there will be award afterwards for the challenges. And then we have a few remarks on the closing. So about challenges. So actually we have three tasks. So first on the object detection with oriented um, bounding box, and the, the second is with horizontal bounding box for the object detection. And the third task will be on the semantic cementation. So the first two tasks um, on using Delta V um, 2.0 as a data set and with both satellite and aerial images. And there are 84 registered teams. For the third task, we use the um, GID 15. And, and so this is Galvin 2 uh, satellite images. So there are 82 registered teams. So um, many thanks to our participants of the workshop and the challenges and authors of the papers and also the, the reviewers. And we particularly thank to these keynote speakers, Ben Shindai, Conrad, and Davis. And also thank the sponsors from CVF for the open access of the published papers and sense time. Okay, so um, uh, let me remind you that this um, 
workshop will be recorded. I'm still, it's, it is recorded now. Okay. So without further ado, I would like to introduce David Toya for his first invite talk. Maybe Davis, can you um, can turn on your, your screen and share your screen? I suppose you are here. Hello. I will end my, my sharing. Okay, great. Yeah. Hey, Davis. Hi, how are you doing? Great. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Uh, hope. So can, okay, you great. See, can you see it okay? Full screen, all good? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so this is David Chua. Uh, I would like to give you a, a minute of introduction, if you don't mind. Go ahead. I suppose. And in case they don't, uh, so Davis um, he had received his PhD degree from University of Lausanne in Switzerland back in 2009. And from 2014 and 2017, he was assistant professor with University of Zurich. Then he was a professor at Wageningen University and Research. Since 2020, he has been associate professor at EPFL. So his research interests include machine learning and computer vision for spatial data, and recently on the new concepts for AI for EO to make images more accessible and the models more understandable. So I guess this talk will be on the, the main recent focus. So welcome, Davis. Looking yeah. forward to your talk. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Gui Song and all the organizers for having me. But, you know, most importantly, thanks everybody for, for joining and spending this day with uh, me and many other very you know, inspiring scientists uh, during the whole uh, program of LUAI. So uh, when Gui Song and Michael contacted me, I thought you know, that they could give a, a kind of an overview of the, of the recent things that we were doing. But then, then I thought, no, OK, let's, let's dig into, into one concept more in detail so that you, you, know, you can get something more from this, this 30 minute talk rather than you know, a, a very long suite of papers. So I thought, you know, let's go uh, a little bit towards this, this new concepts I'm trying to, that I'm really interested in, which is the human machine interaction and especially the interaction in natural language, which is, which is basically what's keeping me very busy <laughs> these this last months. Um, so, but how, how did all this start? It's basically this, this, this overall feeling that we are now hitting a certain level of quality with traditional remote sensing tasks. For example, the, the segmentation of, uh, of buildings, building food, footprints or road detection and so on. It seems that these are, these are tasks that have received a lot of attention in recent literature and that they are also, you know, fairly solved with fairly high accuracy. I mean, I'm not saying that they are not interesting, they really are, but, you know, the, I think that the, 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 we have hit, hit the, that, that wall when we can now go towards production and, uh, and that uh, there, there are other fields that maybe are more emergent that I, I really would like to, to look for. And this is probably also reflected in the, you know, the, the increase of publications and interest that all this interface of deep learning and remote sensing is receiving recently. So I have this graph that goes to 2018, thanks for, to Shoshan Su, who showed it at the conference. And uh, you know, nowadays, I think it's much, much worse than that, but somehow it also gives me a little bit the, the impression that one could, one could get lost very easily in all this deep learning and remote sensing type of uh, type of jungle of models and architectures and papers. I mean, it can be a little bit complicated now to to really like navigate and find where the where the like really new exciting fields of innovation can be. So instead of complaining, I thought, okay, let's try to let's try to put. Put together a little bit of a, of a, of a think tank about it, and uh, you know, I, I I met with a couple of friends, and we thought, okay, let's think about, you know, instead of doing a review, looking back, let's try to look forward, let's try to look at like very interesting things that are not yet solved, and we really would like to see solved in let's say five years, ten years from now, and uh, you know, all this all this reflection took took a few months, but at the end of the day, you know, we came up with this paper that you see here on screen. And uh, basically this, this led us to like six 
let's call them directions that we thought, oh yeah, these things are kind of the, the very exciting things, at least for us six, uh, then I'm sure there is more than that, but you know, with the person I was talking to, we came up with the six. And I mean, if you also want to know uh, a little bit who was the, the pusher for everyone of this direction, I, I'll give you a bit, a bit of a, a visual on what happened on the back. So these are, these are the person who really took, took charge of uh, thinking about each one of these direction, let it be reasoning, physics-based, uh, machine learning, massive multi-source, interpretable AI, causality, or the one that, that I took the, the pleasure of writing about was this human-machine interaction. And definitely this is the topic that I, I wanted to share with you today. So talking about human-machine interaction and for two particular reasons. So the first one is that, I mean, we are working for, uh, for people and we want, we want people you know, to give us the labels connecting uh, with what Michael just said in the introduction. So if we want people to work for us to get these labels, well, we also want to make their life easier and to, to help them be more efficient, less bored and more effective. And secondly, it's not only about getting labels from people, but actually like getting them what they really are trying to achieve, which is answering interesting questions about environmental monitoring. And this will come in a second part. So let's talk about labels first and how we can help people to annotate uh, in a smart way. Like, like, you know, this, this very, very funny XKCD little cartoon that is basically, you know, putting crowdsourcing in, in, a, in a very like interactive, very urgent way. Like if you don't click on yes or no, the, the car will crash. So it's something, I mean, it's not that extreme what I will show you, but you know, it's, I think that gathering labels in a smart and efficient way is very, very important. Because of course, I mean, we have a lot of benchmarks. So there have, there have been also, you know, competition in these very same workshops or there have been some in the past, you know, space, uh, deep globe, you name it. And, uh, but, you know, the, the, the type of tasks they cover are not universal. So there are tasks they are, they have been designed for and they're very effective there. But for many, many, many tasks, actually the majority of tasks, there is absolutely no labels at all. So we have the images because our very dear satellites and aerial sensors acquire for us regularly. So we can get the images, but you know, sometimes the labels are, are missing. Okay, uh, but so in this case, you know, uh, let, let's make a little bit of an exercise. So let, let's pick a, a place at random, like let's go to Tanzania for, for a very short uh, virtual walk and let's pick, you know, uh, a place in Tanzania, so that, like that this uh, this region here, and let's start to zoom in. Now, let's assume that we are interested in uh, digitizing buildings because this is apparently what you know what we are very good at with traditional remote sensing. So we zoom in and we zoom in, we get to the region of Timbira, which is you know surely very interesting. And you know, at some point, we get close enough where we can actually see buildings in rural areas. So you see, there is no city here. It's probably not an area of major economic interest, even for the local government. And, uh, but there are buildings, we can see them. So assuming that things are going the right way, if we go on Google Maps, for example, or OpenStreetMap, we would expect to see these buildings appearing. But if we look at the corresponding OpenStreetMap layer, it looks a little bit like that. So yeah, it's completely empty, basically. There, there is nothing in this area. A variety of reasons can be there. It's probably because it's a you know, rural area in a very remote place. No annotators have ever seen that region. So there was no like manual annotation provided. And uh, so, I mean, this, this like triggered a reasoning that you know, we had all this, all this very precise building cartographies for the Western world. Like Google Africa just released a bunch of, of building footprints in Africa. But I mean, when you get to rural areas, they tend to become a little bit inaccurate. And then on the other side, you have all these volunteers that work for humanitarian on the street, street map or map swipe, and they basically try to locate these buildings on the map. But their work is basically to do that visually and with very, very little help. So they are, you know, zooming in, zooming out. Oh, there is no building here. Oh, let's zoom back again and let's try another region. 
and it can become very, very time consuming. Then we thought, okay, how can we help? And uh, so we, ba we based our, our idea to, on, a, on a work that we already had more or less going on, that we, which was the, a model that was starting from an aerial image or a very high resolution satellite, you know, building a building probability map. And then uh, basically we were looking at existing uh, footprints, vector footprints from the street map, and trying to align them with what had been detected. So this was uh, like a completely offline work that we were conducting with, with John Vargas and a number of colleagues. And uh, we thought, okay, maybe we can start from here and create something that is interactive and really helping uh, human operators that are actually updating these maps. So let me zoom in to this to this interact, interactive part. And you see, it, it looks a little bit like a circle because there is some interaction between a user that you can see here on the right and a convolutional neural network that you see on the left, which is this network that given an image will give you the footprints. Basically the user is free to navigate wherever he wants and to, to choose an image that will appear in the, in the ID environment of OpenStreetMap, and then it could start editing, adding a footprint, moving another, editing, and so on. But the story is how to uh, prioritize the footprints that are of interest and then need to be shown to the human operator. And for this, we decided to, to go for a very simple criterion that will compare the probability map uh, extracted by the current CNN, and at the same time, comparing it with the current footprints and having a number of you know, numerical comparison that, that will give us an indice telling us this tile needs a lot of work. This tile doesn't need any work. This tile needs just one or two little edits. And by doing that, we will be able basically to rank all the images and present them to the user in a very efficient way. Also, because remember, most of the tiles, they do not have any edits to be done. So we want to prevent the user to basically look to tiles where there is nothing to be done, get bored, get inefficient and tired. Okay, so we applied this in, so in Tanzania, so I didn't choose Tanzania really for, <laughs> I mean, there was a reason of showing Tanzania before. And we used a number of, uh, of images occurring in different regions of the country. So every red point that you see here is not one sample, but it's a set of remote sensing images that comes with a notation from OpenStreetMap. We trained the CNN to, to basically detect the, uh, the urban footprints. And then we tried to apply it on the region here in green, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's another area, spatially disconnected from the other, so we cannot cheat. And uh, it has, for the time being, 1,400 footprints. So in the training area, we have 3,100 footprints. In the test, we already have 1,400. But some buildings are missing and several of these annotations are erroneous. So we have mistakes and we need to add new buildings. So even though we have 1300 annotations, 1400 actually, we still have 900 extra edits to be done to really like figure out this region here in green. And here are a couple of results. So the story is that if you let the people zoom in and zoom out randomly, they will end up finding the 900 edits. So let's say the top of the graph, but they will need, so the users will need a little bit more than 4,000 uh, interaction. So this has been done with, with actual people. Uh, so, and uh, so you see, so this means that if you go random, it's the blue line. So sometimes you find something to do, sometimes you don't. And at the end of the day, you will find them. If you use standard, like traditional uh, measures uh, to quantify the interest, like it could be, for example, a mutual information between the, 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 the actual annotation and the prediction of the CNN, yes, at the beginning, you will not find much. At some point, you will find a lot, and then you will keep up going like that. Uh, with the criterion we propose on this paper, which are basically based on really on the comparison, local comparison on every single footprint from a specialized map, we can basically find most of the images very, very quick. And this gets very, very close to the dotted line that you, can see, that you can see here, which is basically a baseline we represent to the user every time the image has most edits to do. So if every time you find the right thing to do, you're done with 400 edits. But with our best strategy, which is the green one here, that 
both uses the ranking criterion and retrains the CNN as we go, we can get to the same result in about 800 instead of uh, you know, a few thousand or even several thousands. So, I mean, no story short, by using this type of techniques, we're basically making the life of volunteers easier, keeping them entertained because there is always something to do. And at the end of the day, we find out all these extra footprints that we are need to have the actual building map as up to date as possible. Cool. Uh, but okay, but then we thought, why, why stop in there? And we could basically make this principle available to a larger number of people if we were developing uh, like fully fledged uh, labeling infrastructure that will work on the cloud, on, on the Microsoft cloud actually, so that every time someone is flying a drone or acquiring some kind of data, camera traps or, or, or remote sensing, they could basically pull their data there and having a, an interactive environment where they could run uh, all the latest deep learning models without having to implement them. So deep learning models that are already there. And then to have you know, this kind of interactive loop, they will rank the images so that they will get all the annotations as quick as possible and so on and so forth. So we started a collaboration with basically Microsoft AI for Earth and, uh, and Bafening University, where I was working before. And uh, basically we tried, we, we, we developed a software suite called AID and uh, that you, you can know everything about it in this paper here in Methods in Ecology and Evolution. But AID is really cool because uh, it works entirely on the cloud or you can also work on your machine if you feel like it. It, uh, it has a, you know, it's run completely in parallel and it can work on your favorite deep learning uh, framework. It can basically uh, process different type of tasks. So if you need to do image classification, like for example, here in the detection of species in ground pictures or counting like by, by doing point-based estimation, bounding boxing for detection, or even pixel-based classification if you are into land use and land cover classification. So all four types of data are implemented and, and everything is in a kind of a very user-friendly type of interface where you can drag and drop, you can move bounding boxes, you can add new classes and just click, zoom in, zoom out. So it's we, we really try to make it as user-friendly as possible. And it's not, it's not at all limited to to wildlife, uh, to wildlife type of pictures. I mean, you can use it for the, the type of images that you like. We just developed it for this. And most importantly, it has a quite interactive active learning design loop where you will basically create your, your own active learning loops, like for with a star, then you start training your models, then you make inference, you can go back and ask uh, the user for more annotation with the active learning criterion that you like and so on and so forth. So everything, we try to really make everything as simple as possible for users that will not be super familiar with the, uh, with the, with the type of methodologies behind, but they can really like take, get the most out of their images in, in, a, in an environment that it's more or less user-friendly. And of course, it's completely open source and uh, you, can, you can go on GitHub, you can branch it yourself and start having fun. And if uh, we, we also like if you can improve it and you know, <laughs> let us know what we are, what we could do better. And, uh, and please get in touch if you like to, to have something like this. Oof. Okay, uh, I hope it was entertaining until here. And uh, so, so in this first part, I talked really about you know, human machine interaction to label data set and to try to integrate some machine learning into the, into the labeling processing so that you can get the most label out of your images in a minimal amount of time. And now in the second part, I would like to, to, to flip that coin. And instead of looking on how we could get more labels, I would like to move at the very end of the spectrum, which is the, the moment where a decision maker would, have, would like to have an answer about a project of interest. And uh, even if us as computer vision specialists, machine learning engineer, regime sensing specialists, we're very good at making this link through, through coding to running models, I mean, it's pretty difficult for someone who needs to take decision to grasp all this. And let me, let me show you what I mean by that, by mostly 
um, relying on a paper that you see here, uh, Remote Sensing Visual Question Answering by first author Silvano Bri, Diego Marcos, Jesse Murray, who I think is even in the, in the audience today, and myself. And uh, we started this, 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 this idea really by trying to give the opportunity to a machine, to a deep learning machine, to basically talk to the decision maker, rather to have this, you know, this, this wall that separates them that needs to be uh, filled by, uh, by computer code. So the idea is that when, you, when we see this anaerobic image, like this image here acquired over New York, I mean, if you know in advance what is your task, I mean, we are all very good at crafting a type of model that will answer a question. So if you want to count the cars, for example, very well, so you will create a neural network for regression, for example, that is counting with, a, with an appropriate loss function, and you will start you know, training back and forth, back and forth until you get it right. Maybe you want to do some object detection followed by counting very well, but I mean, knowing the task and having the labels, important, well, then you're able to solve this task. But what if for this same image, the task suddenly changes? So this time you're not interested by cars anymore, but you want to know if there are some trees, okay? So th the question is obviously, yes, you're looking at the image, your brain is a wonderful image processor, but I mean, if you had to do it, you will actually need to you know, create a, an encoder decoder architecture, maybe do some semantic segmentation, and if you predict the tree class, then you will, you, you will know that there are some trees around. Very good. We also know how to do that as before. But you know, for the same image, in this case, you're already developing two separated models that need two different ground truths. And you know, it's not something that you, that you can answer in five minutes. Now extrapolate that. And uh, you know, there is a number of questions that you can start asking. You could, you could not like know how much how much of the image is covered by road, or if it is Paris, if it's a city after all. Or I mean, the, the number of questions is, is potentially infinite. And uh, I mean, you will have to run very fast is, if every time you have a new type of question, you have to you need to redevelop a whole framework. But this actually happens pretty often because you know the experts that will use our remote sensing technology are very often non-technical experts. So they basically want answer to the questions they are interested in. They're probably not so interested by the deep learning algorithm in the middle solving the question. And most importantly, these same people, they want to formulate their question as sentences. They don't want to formulate them as, as computer code. And this is really what triggered this curiosity. And we ask ourselves the question, like, would it be possible to have an interaction in between a deep learning model doing image recognition and some entity with possibly human asking questions, but in other language. And I mean, it's a super interesting question and uh, it's something that has been tackled in recent vision literature under the term visual question answering. So visual question answering does that. So you have a structure that is very often more or less like this one. So you have on one hand, one image, that will give you like the context and the pixels if you want. And on the other hand, you will have a question asked in English or French, in German, in Chinese, it depends on your also language. But the, 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 the objective of the VQA model is basically to have a model that can do recognition in the image and text processing and together lead you to the answer to your question, which will be, Oh, the more often also a question in, uh, sorry, an answer in natural language. Okay, no, like let's 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 take out the the, the mystery and uh, the the typical VQA model, or at least the model we developed for remote sensing real images, is, uh, is is like that. So we have an image part here on, on the top that is a, a convolutional neural net, quite traditional, a, a ResNet that is extracting some features that you can see here. And then for the question part, we have a recurrent neural network that will go word by word and learn a representation that really encodes the content of the sentence into a vector. Now you see you have these two vectors, you do some smart feature extraction so they, they have the same size, let's say. And uh, by doing that, you're able to fuse it into a single one. Then then you can use in a classifier 
whose answer will be all possible answers. So yes, no, green, blue, uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, urban, rural, and you name it. So actually the, the objective at the end of the PQA is to, to classify your image question pair into one of the predefined answers that you have. So how did we create like a, a training environment for all this? So we had, we had uh, two different uh, applications. So one, one was a Sentinel-2 satellite imaging over the Netherlands, and I will use it for explanation. And then we had a fully fledged um, aerial images over New York, where we, 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 we answered questions about the urban construct in, uh, in New York. But for the Netherlands, we basically extracted the images over the ensemble of the country. So that makes nine images. It's not it's maybe not so much. And uh, we chunked it into 700 and something tiles, so small tiles. So for the images, we were quickly OK. But then to generate the questions, we were, we were to act a little bit more smartly. And uh, we basically relied on OpenStreetMap. And we used the clever protocol, which is a traditional protocol in visual question answering. And we basically used the OpenStreetMap land use layer that will tell us a lot of different urban objects that could appear in image. And then we had a number of randomly generated attributes and types of questions. And with these three things, we, will, we were able to generate questions in English after having generated a tree. So by random sampling, we started to generate questions that would be like, how many roads are in the image? So base question, count the roads. Or uh, base question, presence a random size and retail. So the question will be, is there a small retail place in the image? So we could generate as many trees as we wanted, and we decided to generate 100 questions per every tile, which gave us a data set of roughly 77,000 images. At the same time, if we are able to generate the question, we're also able to extract automatically the answer. Because if, if we are counting the buildings in order to generate a question, how many buildings are in the image, we also have the answer from OpenStreetMap. So we basically could generate the whole data set automatically and for free because we had all the information beforehand from OpenStreetMap. And yeah, all our classes, they could be counting answers. So you see like 89, for example, yes or no answers, the question answer. A couple, and we had 100 of these for every single image, in order, you know, to to simulate that you can answer very different things on one image that you are looking at. So the results were very exciting. So we started with the 79% overall accuracy of, after one week of training, and we were very very happy because you know 80% is something very exciting at the beginning. But then we had to, you know, decrease a little bit our, our level of, uh, of party when we, we, re we realized that when we were like flipping randomly the image, that we were still getting 73% the right answer. And this is, we explained this by the fact that uh, the, 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 the way we generate the questions is not so natural. So like all the questions that are yes or no start by is there. So we make like the, the task for the model a bit easy because depending on how the question is formulated, you almost already know which to be looking at. So we, we should be generating more natural and more diverse questions. And I think that at that point, the model will struggle a little bit more and we really could make each other. But yeah, I mean, all in all, it's, it's a good and a bad thing, but our model is giving like rational answer. So if, uh, if you're asking the model to count something, it's not answering yes. But this is also due to the fact that all the counting questions starts by how many. So yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a give and take story. But here are a couple of examples. So on the left, you can see that we asked the model uh, if this is a rural or a urban area. And the model seems to predict correctly that this is an urban area. And on the right, well, I just show you uh, one example of Rhino's prediction where basically the ground truth is telling us that there is more surface of water than buildings and our model says no. And we were very surprised at the beginning because I see more buildings than water here. But remember, this is the Netherlands and Michael knows very well that if it's the Netherlands, if it's the Netherlands there will be water. So if we look at the OpenStreetMap layer we use for training, you can see that of course you have these very long canals, 
But you also have a lot of very small objects, like these very small canals that someone really had fun digitizing in OpenStreetMap or this little pool in this, in this farm. And all these little objects that are completely invisible in the image because they are so pixel size, well, build up to your ground truth. And these are things that you cannot see in the image. So I think this is also a very interesting point of this, uh, of this data set is that you need to deal with the things that are actually trying to figure out things that you cannot see in the image, which should be there. So which will bring us back to the stories of reasoning and interpretable AI, which are two of the two others of the six directions. But if you want to play with it, all the data sets are open. So there is the low res data set that I just showed you, or there is the very high res data set over New York, which has more, I mean, nowadays more than 1 million image question answer triplets. So I'm sure you can have a lot of fun with that. Okay, Michael, I think I'm right on time. I should be a half an hour. So, I mean, I will, I will conclude here and, um, and hope, hope that you have enjoyed the ride and have some fun listening to this talk. Just remember there is a lot that you can do with deep learning or machine learning in general this day when it comes to satellite images. Uh, my, my, my wish is that you, you, you try to strive for not going for the low hanging fruit. That will be like, oh, let's take this code available from computer vision and apply it to my data. But you know, try to, to really strive for something that is really useful and something that you know, requires some like remote sensing specific developments. And also, and probably also more importantly, don't forget that you're doing all this development for someone, for people that will be using these models and they will need to interpret your results and use them for the greater good. So don't, don't do this processing for the sake of it, but really try to you know, change the world and do something good with it. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, I would like to thank my wonderful team that you can see here at the top of the slide. Uh, I think many of people are in the room, so they, could, they can be very happy to see their picture. And also for a little bit of a totally shameless advertisement, you see in the lower part that we have a book out on deep learning for the earth sciences. It's like just came out, so please grab it and, uh, and read it. it. It has contributions from 80 persons from all possible fields in the earth science and it's very very exciting all the things that they they could they could say about the usage of deep learning in their specific field well the paper in the middle we've talked about it so i will brag i will not brag about it again and on the right since i suppose there must be some students in the room remember that the, the ls phd call 2021 is open so if you want to do a phd in computer vision in europe that's probably a great place to start to send your CV and who knows, hopefully find the, you know, the, the, love, the love your heart is beating, is beating for. So I think the deadline is in a few weeks. So have a look. It's, very, it's a very great network with a lot of opportunities. And that's it, Michael. I give it back to you and uh, I'm ready to take questions. Thanks, Ibis. Very exciting talk. Yeah, I myself enjoyed it a lot. And Please, if, if you have any questions, then you can put into the chat or can you unmute yourself. I didn't see any questions. Yeah, if you want to turn your camera on, it's cool. I like seeing people when I talk to them. Yeah, indeed, if you can. So, so there's one question. Mm, should I read it or, or can, you, can you read it from the chat? Um, okay, I have it in front of me. Give me a second to read it. So, hi, I want to know the reason that restricts the optional attributes into the two specific simple types, such as size and shape. As we can also ask the question, is this building large? This kind of attributes seem unnecessary when compared with other type of questions like the counting or the areas. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a good point. We, we, we had to make choices at some point to generate the data. And of course, when we say large, it's, uh, it's large in the questions, but we ask, I mean, under the hood, we had a specific size that was, uh, that was used to basically decide what is large and what is not. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was a design choice, but it, it doesn't mean that it's the best one. And the, the more complicated you make it, the more difficult questions you will maybe be able to answer, but I mean, we decided to start simple and we get, gave the priority to relational questions, 
like is this bigger than that or are these more than that so this, this i think are are questions that are interesting because they force you to make multi-step reasoning so like you know that you need to first say one thing and then compare it to another and that that's when it really gets exciting so i, I hope i answered the question Kun. Uh, if not just you know. Okay, I, I just checked that I can actually unmute people. So if you are um, you want to ask question, just uh, raise your hand, then I can unmute you or just put into the chat. Uh, and meanwhile, I actually have myself have a few questions, but then we start with the V two A question. Mm, yeah, part it's quite exciting. Yeah. And yeah, um, I noticed that you actually mentioned that all these um, the tasks you are now currently doing, you you put into the classification task, you have triplets and then you classify the pairs on triplets image and question there. Well, in the mm -hmm. end, if you're looking about, thinking about the, for example, how many buildings are there, right? So you actually put in categorize that from one to 10, 10 to what, yeah, some number. So there's actually, then you put into the classification task. So if you yeah. really want to get into the very specific number, for example, five, or let's say 55, even 155, so that's actually more regression task, right? So could you comment Absolutely. on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the, the so the, the paper I shown here today was the, like the first like the first building block about it, and uh, in a subsequent work we presented at the ISPRS Congress uh, last year, we we explored exactly this. So we had a network predicting whether it was a question about counting or about something else. So there was one loss for that, and this was communicating to to a second. Uh, so a second and third loss, one specializing in answering by classes and one doing regression. So like the, 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 first, the first loss will just look at the question, will not look at the, at the image. And depending on the question will tell us if it's the, the, re the regression branch or the classification branch that needed to be activated. And I mean, it, it worked fine, uh, especially for small quantities where this like very broad categorization of uh, between zero and 10 was too coarse. So it's, uh, I mean, the sky is the limit. Eh? It's something that can be implemented that works. Then it doesn't change massively on the numbers in the end, but you get some better answer where you need it. Okay, great. Yeah, um, I see you one um, hands. So I just unmute, unmute you. Yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Tiwa. Uh, it was a great talk. Thank you for the talk. Um, so. I had a question on the smart labeling part of your problem. Um, I also work with OpenStreetMap data a lot for applications with deep learning. And mm -hmm. I like your idea that in the end, we would like to like contribute this back to the community. So how integrated is all this process with the OpenStreetMap like labeling interface? Is this like done offline and then you have to update it separately on OpenStreetMap? Or uh, I just wanted to know how much of this integration is possible with deep learning and OpenStreetMaps as a web platform? I think potentially is uh, the, the potential of integration is high because we, we develop directly for the ID environment, okay. which is the OpenStreetMap environment. Uh, I see John Vargas is in the audience. So John, if you want to, if I'm saying something stupid, just raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, <I can. laughs> there is. And, but I think the potential of integration is high. So this is John is the person who actually did, did the work. Okay. And uh, the truth is that we didn't have like direct contact with the OpenStreetMap people. So in practice, it is not integrated, but it's I, potentially so. I can add right. some comments, Davis. Yeah, go ahead. So, so what happens that uh, like uh, in technically you can do that. You can automate the process of updating something in OpenStreetMap. Okay. But like OpenStreetMap suggests that every edit should be uh, like verified by the human. In the project that uh, Davis presented, uh, we had that. We have users verifying the data that we, are, we were updating on OpenStreetMap. Yeah, I yeah. think that's the main point. Like they suggest that somebody yeah. should verify it's that like, on human. Yeah. Cool integration, if possible. Yeah. Oh, Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you. OK, so any further questions? Yeah, um, I need to unmute you. Yeah. Yeah, no, go ahead. So you unmute it. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. So it was very interesting. And I'm actually working as a senior data scientist in the agriculture domain in Germany. Mm -hmm. And we are currently collecting a lot of data with UAVs. 
And I find this uh, whole process very um, interesting for our challenges. And I, what I wanted to ask you was your opinion on what would be the best way to proceed with annotating the data. So for us, collecting a lot of images is um, not, a, not a big deal. But what we are wondering is what would be the best way forward once we have the data to basically um, maybe get some annotations so that we can start the algorithms. Yeah, it, it's, a good, it's a good, very good question. And we were discussing about it over lunch with my team, actually. And uh, yeah, I, I think if you, if you start from zero, so if you have only the images and, uh, and no labels, the, the story is that you, you need to gather some labels e efficiently let's say enough that you can then start learning some, some more complex model like deep learning models. So, I mean, in the active learning literature, you know, people use a lot models that are maybe a bit old school. It's easy to like jump function, like a, you know, a random forest. I'd like to start there and use active means to so that for samples from the model you have that that means sufficient then you into a deeper with the aid the where then you then you all the other and give of predictions and into leveling but starting without it's a bit tough i on image net and maybe not be very useful if you spend some time in the first points. That will be yes. Awesome. So uh, you, once you have some enemy with the aid soft, could then basically support. You know, or start. I mean, a is to do what you know how to do. Models, then you, friends, you rank your some new put the so AD does in that for you think about it yeah okay all right thanks yes <laughs> okay so the questions please raise your hand and then ask my question you know no other so I have a very quick question second part so this environment in is it Ability to adding classes or different class environment. Let's everything is custom customizable. So you basically start and you defining which classes. Then you you plug in, start to give examples. You, when you you fill your CNS, and you can also add. So then you know, more. It's it's technically. You're not forced to define classes. It was also for, you know, not white type really problems, uh, but the bit of initialization. Okay, yeah, good. Then I also recommend all, yeah, it's extremely fair use. Great. Uh, also, my app to check it out. I don't see any further. So, I have questions on my list, start from the first one. Presentation. Of course, training requires GP, but actually, mm -hmm. if you know um, a bit of update and then uh, CNN model, I mean, you also need to rerun the, um, the whole model, right? So, I mean, we have also been in house doing some active learning part, and then we found out actually the the the, the, the labeling uh, saving actually. On the other side, you have the, the computational cost that increase a lot. Yeah. So mm -hmm. could you comment on this? Um, I mean, kind of trend in the future, maybe you want to look for much smaller um, networks. So the question I asked, because if now we're thinking about many applications in Africa, so they may not, not necessarily have such, let's say, very powerful GPUs there. Mm -hmm. right? So if you want to of always course. update every time the CNNs and then they have to rerun it, so it might be not that, um, you see, let's say. Um, I, I agree, Michael. You, 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 you touch a very, a very good point, which is also very important. So, you know, the active learning business was very like flourishing on 
support vector machine like type of type of methods because they were models that require very very little training and every sample counted but yeah for retraining the cnn i mean you cannot retrain at every sample and uh, it's it's true that for example in aid very often we don't use like pure active learning criteria but we mostly use like image ranking criteria that give you like the most certain images also because the people that you that use it are more interested in labeling their data set and finding the animals rather than having the super difficult examples that change your hyperplane which will have been the like the active learning the active learning story so by the use of aid it's true that we don't use traditional active learning criteria very often even though they are implemented in there and other than that this is also maybe one of the reasons why we also push to have aid working on the cloud on the microsoft cloud is also because it, it is possible and not so complicated to obtain azure credits uh, to run these type of things on the on the microsoft cloud which could be a solution for people in uh, in, in southern countries to, to run this model without doing it in-house when you don't have a GPU and then you have a powerful computer. So in that case, everything is, is in the cloud and the credits can be obtained rather simply. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, and so due to time, yeah, it's a bit overdue. So yeah, so we, we have to stop here to move to the, to the next uh, um, speaker. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Michael. And really thanks nice everybody for attending. <laughs> yeah. Bye. See you later. So take care. Yeah, bye. So I hand thank over you. to uh, Jinjing for the next session. Hello. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, report is presented by Niklas. Uh, his talk title is uh, a Framework for Semi Automatic Collection of Temporal Satellite Imagery for analysis of dynamic regions. Let's welcome. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me or is audio working? Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear. Sorry about that. All right. Hi, my name is Nicholas Kshani Malag, and I'm from Ohio State University. And today I'm going to be presenting our paper to collect temporal imagery of dynamic regions. And this paper was sponsored by the Air Force Research Lab. So recently, satellite imagery providers have been increasing the collection of satellite imagery. And some providers have even begun collecting imagery near daily. So this vast new set of imagery has immense potential. However, the rates at which the data is being collected far outpaces the speed at which it can be analyzed. So manual techniques are becoming infeasible and to best leverage all the data, automated techniques need to be developed. And such techniques could analyze time series multispectral imagery to, de to detect human activities like construction, farming, and urban development. So given the increase in satellite imagery collection, can we employ deep learning on this data? Well, supervised deep learning uses large amounts of labeled training data, and oftentimes in remote sensing, these labels are created manually. So the difficulty of this manual approach is exacerbated uh, also when labeling temporal sequences, since it takes much longer for a person to label multiple images in a sequence. And the bottleneck has hampered the development of remote sensing temporal image data sets for activities like construction. Also, there's no streamlined method available to create new task specific temporal satellite imagery data sets. So to avoid leaning on human annotators for labels, crowdsource mapping systems such as OpenStreetMap or OSM have been leveraged. And OSM is an increasingly popular metadata source used to retrieve labels for regions of interest. And it contains rich labels and shape information and geocoordinates. So it uses three key data structures, nodes, ways, and relations. So a node is just a single point represented with a latitude longitude geocoordinate pair. A way is a polygonal area of interest represented with a collection of nodes. And then relation is just a large conglomeration of land represented with a collection of nodes and ways. And we're going to be focusing on ways moving forward for this work, but a framework could be extended to use relations as well. So here's a snapshot of OpenStreetMap. And on the right, we can see many different labels in the area, like park, residential area, construction. And on the left, we can see the appropriately annotated spatial locations. So we highlighted the construction sites in blue, and we could see each highlighted construction site is a way with some additional information. So it has several tags, like the land use equals construction tag. And we see it's under construction, and it could become a park. So OSM has been previously used as a source for labeling spatial regions. 
And previous works have used OSM tags of ways to identify object classes of interest. And then they use the associated geocoordinates of those ways to collect recent satellite imagery. Previously, temporal data sets have been manually constructed using scraping and annotating. And in such data sets, areas of interest are first identified and then they're manually annotated. So since these data sets were manually constructed, they have sparse temporal samplings. And some of those data sets use as little as two frames, for example. So we ask, can we extend the OSM labeling approach to extract changes in the OSM history and to collect the associated archive satellite image sequences? So here's our proposed framework, and it's split into two stages. We have the way extraction and image collection. So in the way extraction, we first need a user to find object class of interest, start and end dates, a search region, and an OSM history file. And then we analyze the OSM history file in the region of interest to record ways which match the object class of interest. So this stage returns a table of ways that changed. We then use that table along with the user specified satellite imagery provider and padding scale to collect the desired number of images. And the output is the desired number of images evenly distributed across the period in which the way changed. So the collected time series imagery is not further pre-processed and additional filtering could be employed to verify the imagery. That's our approach is semi-automatic. So I'm now gonna go into more detail with the way extraction stage. So an OSM way contains a polygonal object footprint with at least one associated tag. And to the right are a few tags such as building equals house or land use equals industrial. And each time a waste tag is changed, that change is recorded in the OSM history database. So way extraction parses the OSM history and extracts all the ways of an object class of interest that changed in the specified time window. So here's our algorithm for way extraction. We first extract and save the user specified region from the OSM history file. And during this process, we filter out any way whose tag history does not contain the object class of interest. Now this step reduces the number of ways that we need to check and monitor. Then we leverage two tables to track changes in OSM tags of the ways we previously identified. So we consider a change in a ways OSM tag to be a label reclassification. And to determine chronological chronological changes in tags, we iterate day by day through the user specified search window from start to end. So on each day, we get the state of our extracted region in OSM by taking a snapshot of the OSM history file. So we can think of the snapshot as the state of the OSM database on that particular day. And then we record any newly created ways which match the object class of interest. So after we monitor the recorded ways for changes, any changes in tags. So if a tag is changed, then we mark the way as reclassified and we save it for image collection. And the tag can change if it's modified or if the way was deleted. Sometimes we saw that a way will get deleted and then recreated in the same position. So for example, when a construction site changes size, and in this case, we clear the end date of the deleted way and we instead link to the newly created way. Then we monitor this newly created way for any tag changes. So once we determine which ways changed in that time window, we can collect the corresponding imagery. So we first scale each way's bounding box, and then we query which dates are available for download. And then following, we request satellite imagery of evenly distributed dates from the user specified satellite imagery API. So the stage can collect various modalities, including RGB or NIR. And once the imagery is available for download, we download it. So now I'm gonna demonstrate the framework on the task of collecting construction sites. So we define a construction site as an area, of, an area where a structure was erected, demolished, or modified. And our framework will semi-automatically extract satellite image sequences of construction sites from OSM. So we'll then present a classifier task in which we wanna distinguish construction from non-construction sequences. But remember the following task is just a demonstration and our main focus was on this temporal image collection. So here are the parameters for the way extraction image collection stages. We extracted construction from several European countries and collected RGB image sequences of 30 frames from Planet Labs. So we used the following dates with no padding. So using the framework, we are able to extract over 24,000 construction sequences. And here are three of the extracted sequences. So each sequence has a, a unique ID. It also has start and end dates for the first and last days of construction. We can also see the tags of the way before and after construction. And lastly, we have the geo coordinates of the bounding box in latitude longitude coordinates. And we can see that, for example, the third way was a brownfield and then it became a residential area. 
So here are 10 frames from the associated image sequences. And in here, time moves from left to right, where the first frame is the first day of construction and the last frame is the last day of construction. And we chose not to filter cloud imagery and instead leave that to the end user. Hence, the approach is not fully automated. To collect a clean data set, you need to employ a manual or an algorithmic filter following the image collection. Uh, but we can actually see in each of these sequences that we can observe a building was being erected. So now that we obtained the construction image sequences, we're going to explore a simple classification task to distinguish construction from non-construction. So one natural question that arises is, how does the number of frames in a sequence affect the binary classification performance? That is, given that we're now equipped with the dense temporal samplings of construction, how do those additional frames benefit or hinder the performance of the classifier? So we employ slow fast networks, which is a general class of video classification CNN. And the slow fast network uses two paths, the slow and fast paths. So the slow path operates on a sparse temporal sampling of the input to focus more on spatial semantics while the fast path operates on a dense temporal sampling of the input to focus more on quick temporal changes. And a slow network is simply a slow fast network with only the slow path. So we free, first pre-processed our data by removing image sequences, which were too small to observe construction. And we enforced that the longer edge must be at least 45 pixels and the shorter edge be at least 25 pixels. We felt that images smaller than this could not clearly depict construction. Also, if imagery were unavailable by the provider within 15 days of the start or end of construction, we discarded the sequence. So we're left with sequences which were both large enough to observe construction and had imagery near the certain end dates. So for our classification problem, we also needed sequences of non-construction sites too. So to acquire these, we simply shift the bounding box of each construction site, either up, left, right, or down, and ensured it did not overlap with construction. Since some of those shifted boxes still overlapped with the construction, we discarded them and we were left with fewer non-construction sequences. Hence, we have an approximately equal distribution of location, image conditions, and image sizing between the construction and non-construction classes. In total, we have roughly 1,500 construction, non-construction image sequences. So here are some of the construction sequences with their corresponding non-construction sequences. And in each pair, we can see the cloud coverage and the image conditions are similar. So we can see similar cloud coverage uh, across each pair, as well as image conditions. And we can also see that seasonal changes are preserved across the, sequence, the pair of sequences too. So here are the results from our experiments. And we see in table one that slow network trained on 30 frames performed the best. However, increasing, even increasing the number of frames from two to three produced noticeable improvements in accuracy, precision, and recall. Though this isn't surprising, this result highlights the potential of the dense temporal samplings of image sequences that are captured by the satellite imagery providers. And in table two, we evaluated the slow fast variant with 30 frames given to the fast path and a variable number of frames in the slow path. And we observed that using the two path slow fast network only marginally improves and sometimes degrades the performance. So we argue that employing the additional fast path may not be appropriate for this task and a simple slow network is sufficient. This was an interesting study we wanted to look at, but the primary emphasis of this work was to semi-automatically collect the temporal data for tasks such as this one. Note that there's still room to experiment with other experiment with other networks too. So in summary, we saw that there's an increasing interest in automatically collecting and analyzing human activities using temporal multispectral satellite imagery. However, the lack of training data makes supervised deep learning methods difficult to employ. So we propose a two-stage semi-automatic framework to classify temporal satellite image sequences of object class of interest. And the first stage leverages OSM metadata to identify the regions of change. And then the second stage collects the associated RGB and NIR image sequences. So we demonstrate our pipeline on the task of collecting construction image sequences, but the pipeline could actually be extended to support any OSM object class of interest. And lastly, we showed that an end-to-end -end deep learning application using the image sequences collected by our pipeline. So we expect that this pipeline will enable researchers to collect larger task-specific temporal data sets using various OSM tags. And the work could also be extended to collect other domains such as synthetic aperture radar. So at this time, any questions? And I'd also like to invite my um, collaborator, Ash, to the stage too. Hello, all.
Do we have any questions? Okay, if there are uh, not uh, uh, questions, we will go on for the next uh, report. The next report is presented by uh, Hui Ming Sun. His talk title is Convolutional Neural Network Based Remote Sensing Classification and Clean and Cloudy Environment. And that's welcome. Oh. Mm, just please, please wait a second. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hello everyone, this is Hui Ming Sun, a PhD student in Cleveland State University. Today I'm going to talk about our work, Convolutional Neural Network Based Remote Sensing Scene Classification and Clear and Cloud Environments. Uh, so we can see remote sensing scene classification has widely applications in the In the environmental monitoring and geolocation survey, uh, we can see this image example. The first column, the first row is a clear image, and the second row is the same image in remote sensing scenes. And in this work, we mainly focus on seeing clouds. And for our motivation, so in the real world application, so remote sensing scene images taken by the satellite might have two scenarios, clear and cloud environments. But most of existing methods do not consider these two environments simultaneously. So that's we, why we want to do this work. And the related work, some use random forest and uh, support a vector machine to do the classification. But this traditional method can now deal with complex scene due to the lack of overall understanding of semantic and some other scene-based method like uh, Lexa Knight. Rest Knight, VGD16, this deep learning-based method with only if they focused on the global image features. They didn't consider the cloud environments. And for our sorry, for our contribute, a deep learning 
method named the GL Knight, combining the learning of descriptive global and local features for the most sensing scene classification and the clear and cloudy environments. The so interclass dispersion and interclass compactness are embedded in the GL Knight training. And without upside, upside the real cloudy remote sensing scene image data size, we propose a way to study this research problem from data synthesizing. And here is the overall architecture of our model. First, we can see that there are many two branches in the figure. There are five image uh, for the upper branch. So we assign five different locations. First, uh, uh, top left, uh, top right, and center, and the bottom left, bottom right. Obviously, this uh, this is for the global feature. Each image is a uh, uh, thirty percent of the whole of the entire image, and uh, lower branch is the whole image to fit into that global encoder. And the local the local encoder uh, is a shared weight for these five uh, part local images. So then we resize them into a 2D feature, uh, two, a 1D feature vector like this. Uh, we got the six uh, feature vector. And then we resize them to a 2D feature, a 2D feature map uh, uh, with in a size of 16 times 16. And then we combine them to get a feature vector, feature map, and then do the average coding. Uh, uh, to get a small, smaller feature map. And then uh, we flatten, we feed them into a FC layer to flatten them to get the feature to get the, to calculate the uh, center loss. And after that, we uh, feed them into a FC layer again and to get the prediction result. And here is the loss we use in this work. The, ah, remote sensing scene recognition loss. We use just use soft max cross entropy loss to optimize, to optimize this. And And for second loss, we use just a remote sensing scene center loss. We just use center loss to uh, decrease the inter distance and penalize the L2 distance. And the second, the third, which is the overall loss, we use alpha to adjust uh, center loss weight to get back, to expect better results. And for the this side part, uh, we use two this remote sensing this side. One is the uh, which is the most uh, common use uh, this side for class remote sensing classification. One is uh, RSSCN seven, and another is using Mercy for RSCN seven. Uh, this this side have seven classes, and each class is, is consisting of four hundred images. And for using Mercy, uh, this design have 21 classes, and each class is, is consisting of 100 images. And we use 50% of the images to do the training, and uh, another 50% to do the testing. And for the cloud data synthesizing part, we use this function to Reduce random noise with uh, this function random to to the s and this uh, random linking function which produce random noise with the image size of two to s and uh, size this operator that resides the random noise to the cloud image size. We can see uh, this is the whole clear remote sensing image and it's the cloud image we. Uh, 
the the we the cloud image we use this function to generate the cloud. And here is our experiment result. We can see the table one and the table two. Table one is the overall classification accuracy of RSS 7 design, and table two is the overall classification accuracy of RSS 7 cloud design. And for we 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 compete our method with this compatible method. And for the proposed A and the proposed B proposed. Are, uh, it means we, we are using different backbones like uh, uh, Alex Knight and uh, VGD16 and uh, ResNet50. Uh, as we can see, our proposal VGD16 uh, can achieve the best performance over these methods. And here is uh, here are the results for the using Mercy and using Mercy cloud designs. In, in this two table, we can see. Uh, the uh, proposed uh, rest night backbone can achieve the best result. And here is a confusion metric of this uh, classification in RSS 77 design. And we can see the lowest number in 88. And this class belongs to industry. And at the can easily mistake the class to a uh, parking. Uh, we will introduce this failure case in the next two pages. And here is a discussion on the last read parameter for alpha, that uh, this parameter to adjust the uh, center loss. And we do a ablation study for just uh, compare the baseline. When we use alpha, when we set alpha equal to zero, uh, we can see uh, the results. And uh, when we set alpha equal to 0 0.5, uh, we can see we can achieve the best performance. And here we can see some failure case in our uh, experiment. Uh, the right text represents the wrong prediction by our model, and the green text uh, is the uh, wrong choose of the, this image. And we can see this parking and the industry have lots of similarity. For the industry, they both have they have a parking lot and the cars. And for parking, uh, they do have the parking and the cars. And uh, we can see another this uh, six column. We can see that. Uh, this contains many small rectangle shaped buildings and the cloud environment. So the proposed method may confuse the buildings as vehicles. So it can be easily mistake uh, this label to a parking label. So well, thank you everyone. And that's all. Our PyTouch code and this set has been have been published to this link. That's all. Thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, I have a question. Have you tested on real cloud images? Oh, for now, we didn't do that. Mm, we plan to do it uh, maybe later. Do you have any questions? Hi, Fermin. Uh, may I have a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. 
Okay, sorry. Um, is it is it interesting to know which part of your of your model is is especially designed for uh, cloud uh, image? Uh, can you show me. I can. This problem, uh, we just uh, synthesize the cloud this side to do this work because. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. But uh, in our model, we didn't uh, do that. And did you test your image? Did you test your model on a larger, for instance, same classification uh, data set with uh, more than 2,000 uh, remote sensing image in your, uh, in, in your data set? Did you, did you try that experiment? Uh, no, but we just uh, do some. Uh, we just use these two remote sensing data side to do this work. If you uh, can, you can just uh, tell me which data side you are want to know our performance. Uh, can uh, you can test it, and uh, I may test it uh, with our model. Okay, and you only test image. Uh, I don't know on, on, on your studies, SC. I cannot remember the name of the data set. You uh, synthesized some cloud image with uh, that uh, data set, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay, now we have a, a small break for 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes for break and 10 minutes later we come back for the second uh, keynote speech from Professor Colonel uh, Shindler.
Hi, Professor Carlos Angela. Hi. I'm Grace Monsha, the co graduate of this, uh, this workshop. Could you help me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, do you need to try uh, to check whether your slide is, is okay to share with us? I'm sure is, is the sound okay? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's very yeah, not too so much noise because there's some construction outside of the building. They just started today. No, it's okay. It's very clear. Good. Okay, I'll just quickly see whether the screen sharing works. Okay, thank you. So can you see it? Yeah, it's very clear. Is it working? Yeah. Could we go to the video just to make sure it plays? Okay. Yeah, beautiful movie. Okay, good. Okay, good. Shall I leave it or unshare it so that you can start the workshop? Uh, you can share it, but now I, um, we will start at uh, half past nine. Okay. People may be not there. Anyway, I thank everyone here. So uh, it's our great honor to um, invite Professor Connor Sindler to for the second keynote speech. Uh, let me have uh, maybe two minutes for the introduction of Professor uh, Sindler. Uh, Professor Sindler received a diploma engineering degree from uh, uh, Technology uh, Venya Trail in 1999, and the PhD degree from Graz University of Technology, uh, also in Graz in 2003. He was a photogrammetric engineer in the private industry and hold position at uh, Graz University of Technology in Australia and ETH Zurich in Switzerland until Darmstadt in Germany uh, since 2010. He has been a tenured professor of photogrammetry and remote sensing with um, ETH Zurich. His research interests include computation, photogrammetry, and remote sensing. Uh, he received the Small Prize Honorable Mention from the i 2 Computer Science Society in 2012, and also the award of uh, another award from the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and several other best presentation award at the international conference. So Professor Sintana is a leading expert in the interdisciplinary of computer vision and remote sensing. And we are very, it's, it's a great honor to have a invited speech toward a Lotion Bells, uh, give my professor okay. much for the uh, kind intro. Thanks for having me in the workshop. I will tell you a bit about our recent efforts to create uh, vegetation and biomass maps at global scale. So um, what is it that makes us interested in forests? And um, actually, if you look at the, um, what the United Nations has as a strategic plan, there is this plan that the forest area should actually increase worldwide for the climate for biodiversity. Particularly important is um, to maintain the carbon stocks. So the amount of carbon that is stored in the forest biomass, and therefore that is not in the atmosphere causing global warming. 
And of course, it should also be sustainable forest management. So deforestation should halt and um, especially deforestation of valuable forests, which due to the pressure due to increasing population continues to be a problem. So it's good for the climate, it's good for biodiversity, it's finally also good for the humans, it's finally it in sustainable development goals. So um, we want to preserve and manage the forest worldwide. And the question is, what can earth observation do for that? So the first thing is that you need to know where that forest is that you want to preserve. And of course, you can, on the other hand, not just blindly say, don't touch any tree anymore. That is just not realistic because humans also have needs. And so people have come up with this strategy to say we prioritize by biomass. So the so-called high carbon stock approach. The high carbon stock consortium, this is actually uh, led by uh, NGOs, but also include, include, uh, includes companies and, and national bodies. And the idea is basically to classify or to um, distinguish forest that is particularly um, valuable, dense, species rich, and to protect that more. And to say, if you have to develop, do it in places where there is open land or scrub, where you do the least damage. And then there is a threshold that says, from where on is it high or very high carbon stock? So that is a sort of a side show. And in order to use that for local management, we of course need to map it. And we want to map it at high resolution. So we don't want to make just a map that says, you know, in big kilometer squares, where is high carbon stock forest? Maybe just binary or something, but we actually want to map the biomass at 10 meter resolution, ideally, 10 meter being the lower limit of what you can get with regular cheap coverage of satellite imagery. So we say, let's take the satellite images that are around, particularly European Earth observation satellites, and try to combine this with modern machine learning techniques to make inference about the forest. So biomass is something you cannot directly measure, but there is one thing that you can measure which correlates very well with biomass, and that's the height of the forest. So basically, um, you see here that if you look at these um, classes of carbon left is more high carbon stock and right less and this correlates pretty well with how high things grow so this gives us a cue where we can start measuring the density and the height and sort of physical parameters in terms of the data for many this will not be new what we use are the european earth observation satellites in particular sentinel 2 and 1 so since we are optical imaging people mostly our sort of stock main sensor is sentinel 2 this is a satellite you see it on the left in an artistic depiction that has a multispectral camera. So it takes pictures in the visible and near infrared and shortwave infrared spectrum, a total of 13 bands, 13 channels. And some of them, in particular red, green, blue, and near infrared, are at 10 meter resolution on the ground. And then there are other bands that are narrower, like a red edge and some further infrared that have 20 meters. And finally, then you have some bands at 60 meters. And the nice thing about this satellite is it revisits essentially all the land masses of the Earth with a revisit rate of at most five days. So you get very regular coverage everywhere on Earth with a homogeneous sensor. And it may, of course, also be interesting to use radar. Um, it's not affected by clouds. It sees certain structural properties beneath the immediate surface. And there is also a satellite that is comparable in the radar domain. So there's the Sentinel-1. Each of these configurations has multiple satellites, but uh, they, just, uh, they basically just staggered so that the coverage gets better. So Sentinel-1 is a C-band, so about six centimeter wavelength synthetic aperture radar. Um, the ground sampling distance, like for most side looking radar is not quite square. So it's approximately five by 20 meters. And this one has an even higher revisit rate because the coverage is bigger if you don't look straight down. So those are the sensors we'll deal with in the talk and Sentinel-2 will be the main um, sensor to work with. For those who might not have seen it, I guess most people have seen it, but here you have example images. Uh, these are images from Paris, the thing on this uh, weird structure on the top left and on the right side is actually the Arc de Triomphe. So you see, it, it's pretty good. You have a good resolution. You see individual streets and so on. But of course, uh, you cannot distinguish individual trees. That's just not the resolution you can get with good coverage from space. 
uh, this you also see the channels here probably many will And now let's use those. So the first step is how can you even map vegetation height with such a sensor? And the principle we use, so there is no stereo or something. This is not stereo triangulation or something. The sensor looks straight down. It's monocular. So there's only one viewpoint from the orbit on each pixel. And there's not much you can do about that. So we actually have to do some sort of a monocular height estimation, which Geometrically speaking, is in post. It's not possible, but nevertheless, the sort of plant community, the texture gives you information. So we will do this daring thing. We'll just take the Sentinel raw image, stick it into a big black box, which is a convolutional neural network. So it's just a generic predictor, a regression engine. And the output should be a map of the same res spatial resolution as the input image, so 10 meters per pixel, with a value of the canopy height. So this is literally just a regression engine. Um, for those who are interested in the technology, it is the ResNet uh, without any um, striding so that you preserve the resolution. Has 18 res blocks. They use separable convolutions to save some parameters. So the spatial and the spectral dimension are separated. And the loss for this is straightforward regression loss. So it's a least squares. You can also do L1, makes little difference, but in this case, it's the least squares loss with a bit of regularization of the weights, just weight decay. So as I said, residual blocks with separable convolution just to um, factor out some parameters. So it's, it's essentially a, an adapted version of, of the separable convolutions that are also in the web exception architecture. And so how do we see where that even works? Because in the beginning, when somebody proposed to me to just look at a satellite image and extract the height, so this is not even monocular depth, this is where This is monocular relative depth of the tree relative to the um, Earth's ground. And when somebody proposed to me, I said, I'm not sure this is ever going to work, so we have to try. And how do you train? it? So the data we use as ground truth for the vegetation height is created with LIDAR, so with airborne laser scanning where you can get responses both from the tree tops and from the bottom and get very accurate vegetation height. Um, we use these two examples here to present it. The left side is a country of Gabon in tropical Africa, where there is a lot of LIDAR data from the calibration campaigns of NASA. And on the right side, that's Switzerland, where I'm from, and where we have very nice uh, combined LIDAR and photogrammetric vegetation height from the forest inventory. And here you already see the first results. So if you train on such data and then you predict on some test data, you, uh, what the plots show is the correlation. So on the X axis is the ground truth height and the Y axis is the predicted height. And you would want to be along this black dash diagonal. And you see it's lining up pretty well. And for Switzerland, it also lines up pretty well. Note the scales are different. So in Gabon, in the tropics on the left, in the rainforest, the trees are much higher. And you also see this, that it has a little bit of a saturation effect. So at about 50, 55 meters, the predictions don't get any higher anymore. They cannot distinguish even higher trees. Here you get some qualitative work. So two examples from Gabon, then the ground truth, and the next you see the prediction. So it's actually the, the forest structure, the different heights of resolved, I would say. There's a slight bit of example so the high frequency changes in height between you know stands of higher and lower trees are a bit smoothed down this comes from the big receptive field unfortunately um, and there's uh, there's basically no systematic offset so the the average error is really zero there's no systematic bias. we've also done ablation studies to see which bands actually contribute so some people will tell you well you need to use infrared indices and so on other people will say you have to look in um you have to use all the bands because machine learning is that the classifier choose and so on so you try different things um in principle it's true that you should of course just use everything and let the classifier choose but um we find that actually the high resolution the 10 meter bands are the most important ones everything else is sort of nice to have but not as necessary so if we leave them out it gets worse if we take only them it's almost as good 
The important thing, if you think about other canopy height maps that you might have seen, usually they saturate quite early, right? They stop at 20, 25 meters and everything above is sort of not differentiated anymore. Ours go up to more than 50 meters before they saturate. And here the trick is actually to use high resolution and especially to use texture. So if you just go at per pixel spectral response, then indeed you saturate up there. We tried that. So we restricted our model to make all convolutions one by one so that you cannot see the spatial neighborhood, but you still see the spectral response. You have the same capacity in terms of nonlinearity. And that works well for the low trees or okay. But then as you go higher, it quickly deteriorates. So texture plays an important role. And I guess that is why I'm having good texture descriptors. And the best we have are, of course, at the moment, networks and really improves the situation and reduces the error for the tall trees. We then applied this also to the whole country. So you can indeed make country-wide maps. This does scale pretty well. At inference, you can parallelize it very easily. And then um, you see those maps um, on the left is the map we created. On the right is what was there before. That is a one kilometer map um, from uh, by NASA. And there you see again, this effect actually, first you see that the detail is much higher at 10 meter, of course. But the other thing is also you see the saturation. So in this little inset, you may see that here at the river mouth, there are very high trees, there's yellow color. And this is actually true. You can see this in the ground too. These are coastal mangrove trees that grow really high and that are completely missed if you don't look at these texture properties. We also have Switzerland and uh, there actually, we don't know what happened, but in the previous map, in this uh, NASA satellite map, something went wrong, probably something with radar pro processing in, topo in strong topography. We don't know what happened, but uh, basically it's not usable. Um, so we don't need to look into that comparison any further. So to conclude this basic, very simple idea of just regressing the height, um, it can be done. So you can look into a monocular satellite image and get an idea about the tree height. Um, it saturates at some height, but a relatively high one. Texture is really important and high resolution bands of Sentinels, so the visible ones that have 10 meter resolution are actually the most important ones. Okay, so now we have a basic building block, but how can we scale this to the world? We don't have LIDAR everywhere. So there is a thing, um, JEDI, which is a laser scanner mounted on the International Space Station. So it's mounted on the space station, looks straight down, and it takes uh, individual shots, footprints of about 25 meter um, diameter, where it measures the laser returns. So it could, in principle, resolve the vegetation height. And that would be very nicely distributed around the world. It's sparse, but it's everywhere on the globe. Um, but first comes the question, well, how do you estimate the vegetation height from the raw waveforms? So the, the principle is this, that's depicted here in the middle. You look, you send down a laser pulse, and you measure the time it takes to fly down and back up. So you measure the return time. And then some arrive earlier because they're already reflected at the canopy top, but some are only reflected at the ground and some in between. And if you digitize that waveform return, you can see, well, where is the first, where's the last, how's the density in between, and you can make an inference about the height as well as the density of the vegetation. So this is how the movie from the space station and instrument is mounted. So just the principle, it's in our beams, actually multiple, and it does this profiling LIDAR along the flight direction, as you see here. And what you get out is laser response. So it's a one-dimensional signal about the returned intensity of the uh, LIDAR energy. So it's plotted here on the left. So over time, you get a signal over time with different amplitude, and from that, you have to extract the canopy height. And this seems straightforward, but it's actually not due to the strong atmospheric noise and so on. And when we got the first data from NASA, there was a problem because they didn't know how to do it right everywhere. They had six different calibration algorithms and they couldn't exactly say which one works well where. So they said, for your area of interest locally where you want to work, just try them all and choose the one that works best. 
which for us wasn't an option because we want to do it everywhere. Then we have to try them all everywhere, which wouldn't make much sense. So therefore we decided we have to improve the calibration. And we did something similar as before. We use a one-dimensional CNN. So we treat this as a one-dimensional signal. We get a convolutional network and uh, estimate the canopy height, canopy top height directly from the signal. Now, what's important is this will not work equally well everywhere, depending on vegetation density and our atmospheric influences and so on. And we also want to have an accuracy of this. So we use Bayesian deep learning. Some people just call it ensemble learning. In the end, it's an ensemble implementation of Bayesian sampling. So you basically run multiple networks that uh, are trained as independent as possible. So with different initializations and you use the ensemble to estimate uncertainty. And on top of that, for each of them, you actually use a log likelihood function as a loss so that you also estimate the aleatoric uncertainty. So the sort of random error in the data, not just the model uncertainty due to the lack of training data for not having seen all the features of this. So you get this loss function that is basically a squared error loss, but it's scaled by the standard deviation, by the variance. So what this says is when you're not sure, it doesn't cost as much. And of course, sort of the model should have a bias to say, I'm never sure, so I don't make a mistake. And therefore you regularize it um, by also trying to keep the variance low. And this is effectively the loss that you get if you directly um, take the exponential of that, uh, the negative uh, log of the Gaussian likelihood. So you implicitly assume there's a Gaussian distribution of it. So with this, you can then do this ensemble averaging and you get both the model uncertainty, the epistemic uncertainty and the aleatoric one. It's the principle, of, let's say, a simple engineering implementation of Bayesian deep learning. And then again, we got not only LiDAR waveforms, which are everywhere, but we got some calibration plots. You see they're unfortunately distributed over the world. Some of the, in America, some in Central Africa, a bit in Europe, and then some in Australia and Southeast Asia. There's nothing in the rest of Asia and there's nothing in South America, but let's hope we cover at least all the um, geographic latitudes and we'll give it a try. So these are the places that are used as training data to calibrate this. We take the laser scanner, we use the true canopy height extracted from there, and then we use this as training data to produce uh, LiDAR waveforms. So how does that work? Um, as you see, it uh, luckily works pretty well. So it is almost no bias. The root mean square error is around three and a half meters. Um, on average, it's a bit higher for higher trees, but lower for lower ones. We did a cross-validation with different geographic areas to make sure it's not extremely biased towards one region, and luckily it's not. So you can leave out um, some region of the Earth, a compact region like all of uh, Europe or all of Africa, and test, and it still works. So that's good. And we also see that the uncertainties luckily are very nicely calibrated. So here you see what happens if we say, well, we trust our predicted uncertainties and we exclude the 30% most uncertain points, those where we have the least confidence in our estimate. And what happens is actually what you see here that you know, the strip gets narrower. So indeed, we are removing those with the lowest error and the RMSE goes down by a full meter. So there is a good correlation between what we predict is uncertain and what really has a high prediction error in expectation. So here's what you get if you do that with all the Jedi waveforms. This has to, had to be accumulated in very big boxes. That's because those waveforms are so sparse. If I would give you only the, wave, uh, the footprints of Jedi, you would unfortunately not see anything on this map. So we have accumulated an average over every big 50 kilometer cell and printed that. So that only gives you a rough low resolution image so that you can see at all what is going on. But at least the patterns you see um, are all very plausible where the trees are high, where the trees are low. So people we have asked uh, who know more about forests seem to agree with this map pretty much. 
and we also get the uncertainty map. Um, you see it correlates with the actual map. So where the heights are higher, also the uncertainty is higher. So, so there's a relatively constant um, relative uncertainty in the percentage, 15 to 20% treatment. Um, a nice sanity check. Uh, we ask our model, we know that in the training data, the highest trees are 70 meters. And we ask our model, is it just an interpolator? Does it always predict heights below 70 meters? No, it actually doesn't. It does predict heights outside that range, but the epistemic uncertainty increases. So the model is less sure of what it predicts because it says it hasn't got um, a good representation of this. It hasn't seen this in the training data. So this seems to make sense. Um, that the uncertainties are well calibrated to pick out cases where the model is unsure because the data has not given it the possibility to learn the relation well. Good, so now let's put these things together. We have the footprints, which are sparse, but globally well distributed. And we have the images, which are dense and high resolution. And we can, of course, use one to train for the other. This is still a bit work in progress, but I'll show you what we have. So we take all those, we download all the satellite tiles for this whole region. You see it's cut off. Unfortunately, Canada and Siberia are partially missing. This is because the International Space Station doesn't reach those on its orbits. It stays between 51 degrees north and south. So therefore, unfortunately, we don't have any data from Jedi there. And we take all the JEDI measurements for the period before we start the project. So that's April, July, 2020, so that's good. Get um, a large number of such measurements. Very, they're unevenly distributed, but there are some shots everywhere where there's vegetation within this area of interest. And then we look um, for sentin 2 images. We filter those out, which have a lot of clouds because they're, of course, useless. It's optical remote sensing. So if there's clouds, we don't see the ground. We take the ones that have least clouds, multiple images, and we pair them with uh, the sparse shots from JFI. So that's how it looks like. In the top, that was our ground truth from airborne laser scanning. It has some white gaps, but mostly it covers everything. In the middle, you see what the JEDI tracks look like. So they're a lot sparser. You, basically only get a point shot. You don't get the neighborhood texture. So it's a much poorer supervision signal, but still, let's try. At the bottom, you see the aligned tiles of the images that you can correlate with these individual shots. We use the, we first calibrate the jet, those as ground truth to uh, learn the regression from the satellite images. Here's our very first early result. This is only Southeast Asia, obviously. Um, so we've used this as a validation area to check how well that works. Um, the good news it is it works with a model that covers all this whole large area. You don't have to locally calibrate. You can actually learn a global or large scale model that has the same parameters for all this big area and makes quite good predictions. It also still doesn't saturate too early. That sounds about looking at other and um, the accuracy is still quite okay with the mean average error for those trees here, which go up to 50 meters and even more. Talking about biomass before, as I said, we're still at tree height because biomass is very hard to measure, but here we did have the chance. So here in the north of Borneo, we actually have known biomass measurements from a LIDAR campaign from Greg Asen's group. And we, but we don't have the, in the large scale. Um, so what we did is we trusted our tree heights and calibrated a smaller model that would then translate canopy height um, for Southeast Asia to biomass. And then you can, of course, sort it into those uh, carbon stock categories and overlay it with other map layers. And here's what you get. So that is the map, uh, to my knowledge, first ever high carbon stock map for this large area. Um, just to uh, explain, the red areas are the built up ones, so that's urban regions. We have to mask those out because Jedi doesn't know anything about the land cover. And the Jedi shots will also show a high vertical dispersion if they're in the cities because you get some reflections from the roofs and some from the roads. And therefore, it's like high trees for the Jedi sensor. And then, of course, 
approach also only wants the natural forest. So therefore we have to um, mask out or, or denote where there are trees. So there are canopies, uh, arguably they bind some carbon, but they're actually agricultural, mostly mono-agricultural plantations for old palm and coconut. We have mapped those in an independent project and just overlaid them. So that's those yellow, light blue areas, yellow mostly in uh, Indonesia, where there's a lot of uh, palm oil production. You actually can see if you look at Sumatra and especially at Borneo, but also in Malaysia, how these plantations are sort of encroaching on the forest. Just to remind you, in these large scale maps, it just looks like coarse. So this could also be low resolution, but we do have really have this um, images. So here you see because effectively they're a bit less because of service ground truth are. So at every, you have a 10 meter pixel, but what you actually see um, the biggest height in a radius that covers that pixel. So there's a between effective resolution and pixel size. And um, you really have this individual little fields and buildings and so on. We have this uh, canopy top height and carbon stock classification. So that's the resolution that the whole map has. I can't just show it. You can explore it on the Earth Engine or on the internet. We've published the map, but I cannot show it in this large scale. I have to zoom in to a little time. Like Good. What else do we need to uh, get a good global biomass estimate with lets of an arrow? We need to know the forest structure. So the point is forest structure is not just height. It's not just the top of the canopy, but there are actually other properties that influence that. Um, one of them is the mean height on top of the maximum height. So sort of what is the average height of the plant community because some stick out and go higher. Then there's also the vegetation density. So in vertical direction, how much mass is there? Is Are these dense trees with many branches or are these more thin ones? There's also the, the Gini index, so sort of the inequality in distribution. Are they all in one place or evenly over the height and so on? So these are variables that are used in forestry to characterize the density of the forest. And if we had all those, um, we could of course be much better in predicting the biomass than if we just had the height. So again, the question is, can we do that? Um, and we tried that uh, in a project in Norway, uh, where we, again, essentially it's a Bayesian regression system, but now it's a multi-regression. So multiple quantities are put out, uh, again, trained on data that was extracted from LIDAR. And we also tested the contribution of a SAR, of sat satellite aperture radar, to see whether that could also help. So again, it's a, it's a sort of a convolutional network. It has an input, it has inputs from optical and SAR. Actually, we use both, uh, we use two SAR images in, as input, one in ascending and one in descending orbit that proved to be better than having only one so that you have the complementary properties of shading and layover and so on. And we put that into the network. The network does its magic and it outputs two things in the regression head again, a mean value, and a standard deviation. So it's again a Bayesian learning approach. So that's how it goes. On the left, uh, the radar images only have two colors, red and green. That's two polarizations that are recorded in Norway, yeah, VV and VH. And then we output um, those, what's in the third column. So we try to predict um, where we, on the left, you, in the second column, you see the ground truth. In the third, you see the prediction. So that is, for example, the height or uh, the density, and also a standard deviation for those estimates. And uh, you see that uh, the standard deviation sort of correlates with the absolute error, although the error is a lot grainier. So of course, the standard deviation is sort of an expected error. So it's a bit average, and that these maps um, correlate very well. Actually, in numbers in Norway, where uh, the vegetation is, of course, a bit more uniform than in the tropics, it works really well. So we get the uh, mean average errors of uh, less than two, about one meter for the height, order of magnitude, and a few percent, so let's say three to eight percent for the other variables, especially the density, um, about five percent. So. so this is actually um, pretty good. 
You also see that the models are very well calibrated. So this ensemble almost perfectly follows the unit diagonal. So the empirical root mean square error that you observe and the root mean, the root mean, so the square root of the predicted variance on average in expectation align almost perfectly. So this probabilistic model is, despite the simplifications that you make to make it tractable, very well calibrated in our view. So here you see this for every single variable. How does the prediction um, align with the reference data? And um, this works very well. There are some cases like the cover and the genie where the value range is relatively small. So those rarely ever fall to the extremes but the cover mostly falls to the extremes because they scan only over dense forest where there's a high cover. So there are a few pixels, unfortunately, where um, you exploit, you use the full range. But nevertheless, I think uh, you see that surprisingly, those metrics can aggregate over 10 by 10 meter pixels and be estimated surprisingly well from just um, satellite images alone. So where is actually the information? Of course, you want to have the ablation. Where do you get that information from? Um, we find the workhorse is actually Sentinel-2. So the optical satellite is what gives you um, most of the information. Adding SAR helps a bit consistently. So you see from the middle to the top line, it's from S2 only to Sentinel-2 plus Sentinel-1. You consistently get a bit better for the height measures. And um, if you use only one of the two radar images, you end up in between. So using both the uh, ascending and descending indeed helps more than using only one of them. So we just randomly pick one or the other for the simulation. The SAR alone, at least in the way that we treat it in this image processing manner, so it's essentially ground correct amplitude, um, it does not um, reach the performance of the optical. One could of course do some more dedicated processing to get a little bit more out of there. Nevertheless, one is of course limited by, a, by the availability of a decent VM. Okay, so where is this going? Um, the problem with biomass, which is the ultimate goal, is that there's very, very little reference data. There are some systems you can look on the internet and you find this forest observation system. Turns out there are very few data points. Some of them are extremely old. Um, down to 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, so no longer current. And um, access to the data is also not all that straightforward because measuring biomass in the field is an arduous task. So how should this go to global? So possible solutions. One is to use the JEDI waveforms, which actually have the full waveform information for these big footprints and extract um, biomass from them with some other method. And then you would have ground truth, truth to scale, uh, to use as ground truth for the satellite images for training. Actually, JEDI has for the waveforms just recently released the first version of the biomass. And we're still about a bit dubious whether we can use it because it has a pretty big error, 50% uh, or so, but we hope this might get better. The other possibility is to follow a bit the thing we did in Indonesia and say, well, first extract the forest structure, not just the height, but actually additional structural properties, because this we can train in smaller areas and get a reliable model where we have, um, we can train on large areas, but we can get a reliable model because it's, you know, dense large coverage from LIDAR, airborne LIDAR, and then afterwards use a second step that will calibrate that to biomass, hopefully using less training data. Um, that would be another way of doing it. Uh, it's not yet sure which one will work better. Um, that's to be left for the future, but we hope that in the near future, there will be high resolution maps of biomass for the whole earth. Could then hopefully um, manage efforts. So that's it. From, um, are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Professor Connor Sentinel. Do you have any questions? Yeah, there's a question uh, in text. 
or in the chat, is there a field surveying available, like photos taken by volunteers for canopy height? Um, one could, in principle, use ground photos to triangulate the height. Um, there is no large scale data, and I think acquiring this is well distributed would be hard because you have to go deep into forest that is hardly accessible. There are actually people who take ground truth plots. They usually do that with terrestrial LIDAR, or which is more uh, easier for them to do than doing it camera based because the forest can be pretty dense. But I think global coverage, you know, this, the earth just has an incredibly big amount of uh, pixels. It has a huge area and covering everywhere representatively will be relatively hard. It may be good as an additional cue for validation, but I don't think we can get to the volumes that would replace airborne LIDAR at the moment. Second question is, what if there are too many clouds in Sentinel-2? Um, well, then we have to fall back to Sentinel-1, uh, which unfortunately, at, with the present methods, we, we could come up, uh, would entail quite a loss in accuracy. What we do in practice is we use the fact that forest height doesn't change dramatically, right? I mean, forests grow a little bit and some bits are cut down, but by and large, the height is stable over a whole year and more. So we collect data for a whole year. That is in a five-day interval, that's 72 images of every area. And then we sift through them with the cloud mask and we keep, say, those images, 10 or so, which have the lowest amount of cloudiness. And then we predict for, Within those 10, we predict for all the patches where there are no clouds, and then we do a consensus over the 10 images only among the non-clouded images. And that means that the chance that you get at least one or two cloud-free shots of every location is pretty large. And in fact, um, if you, I should maybe show that in the, in the presentation again. So. Yeah, any other questions? So if I go back to the Gabon map here, Gabon is actually one of the worst countries in the world for clouds. It's bang on in the tropics and on the coast. So there are little patches. There are a few little pixels. You see this, I'm not sure there are even any in here where there is really not a single cloud free shot, but it's way less than 1% of the area. Okay, other questions? Could the methodology be used to map biomass change, for example, from one year to the next? Um, in principle, yes, uh, within the accuracy. So if we, we don't know yet how well we can map biomass, but it seems that we're at least bounded by what we can do for the forest parameters, so it's probably plus minus 10% at least. So the biomass change would have to be pretty massive because if you have two data sets, you do it this year and next year, and you have a 10% error on each, then you would need a, on average a 14, 15% error to have a, some statistical significance pick it up uh, change. So that is probably hard. Of course, clear cutting can be detected. If you want to do that on the short term, I would rather go for a sort of change detection. So if you're interested in change from now to next year, I would take the images from now and next year, put them together, some sort of you know clever image differencing, feed them to some Siamese network, whatever you want, and try to find directly where have things changed. Learn where is it same and not really changed except for elimination and weather and so on, and where is there really a surface change. I think the method does have a big potential for long-term monitoring. So if you want to make a new biomass map every five years and see the long-term trends and distributions, then that's where you really need to map biomass and not just change because it will model up everything because other parts of the earth change too that are, or there are changes which might not be directly due to biomass changes. Okay, how to achieve the height of plants when the vegetation are sparse and or when they block the ground? This is actually the point. We don't probably see the ground. When you look in the rainforest, the vegetation is so dense that, I mean, the LIDAR sees the ground because it shines between the leaves, but in the optical satellite image, 
it's almost sure that you get that the ground response is completely masked. So we're actually not seeing the ground. That's the weird thing. We see how strong is the vegetation response. So, so how, how, what are the plants? Basically, some sort of proxy of the photosynthetic activity through infrared. We do see the texture. So what does it look like? What sort of plants are there? But we do actually, in many cases, probably not see the ground. When the ground signature comes through, that it already means the forest is fairly sparse. So that's the tricky thing that it's actually not a geometric measurement. It's probably some sort of guessing what sort of trees in what composition um, and with what, how much activity are growing there. But uh, it is very hard to unravel what the actual signal is. Any other question? So do you have five minutes for questions? Okay, if there's no question, I have, well, I have one question from uh, my side. Uh, as you introduced in your experiment, you use optical image, you also use um, uh, synthetic aperture radar image, you use G-Dye waveform. Um, this, uh, uh, my question is that how do you uh, calibrate this different kind of uh, uh, multimodality data for for the estimation of uh, the calopy uh, height um, uh, in the environment. So let's start with the satellite. I guess you're talking about the relative geometric alignment, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, so for the satellite images, we found that it's pretty good. Um, so the misalignment between Sentinel-2 and our ground range corrected Sentinel-1 is relatively low. We, we've optically, visually, it looks like you're good to a pixel and um, we simply ignored it. So there could be actually residual misalignment errors, but um, we live with those. For the JEDI, there is a misalignment error up to maybe half a footprint. So it could actually be that sometimes we're getting the height of the neighboring pixel and again, there's nothing we can do about it. There is at the moment no way of um, uh, geolocalizing it more accurate than to whatever 12 meters or so. Um, so there is a certain chance that we're sometimes shifted by a pixel. Um, that also explains why the maps we will get will always be a bit blurrier than an effective 10 meter resolution. But if you think about it statistically over the large run, the canopy height of the forest actually doesn't change so quickly. So by and large, at a 20 meter, 25 meter resolution, we should still be right. Uh, our advantage is that whatever error we make, there is probably masked, at least in the global scale, because the JEDI has this big footprint of 25 meters, which means that in reality, smaller structures cannot be well resolved anyway. Okay, thank you. And do, you, do we need to uh, uh, design some special structure in the, for instance, in the uh, neural network to deal with the different modality of the data? Um, we tried many things, but didn't really find a big improvement. Um, I would say it's the usual tricks of the trade for a large scale, like for remote or aerial imagery. You don't want to have a huge amount of downsampling and striding because you will just blur out the signal too much. So then you would need so many skip connections that it defies the purpose. Um, we did find empirically that uh, as similar to, uh, to general computer vision, small kernels and more depth usually helps better. So we didn't put in 18 res blocks or so 36 layers <coughs> just for fun to make it look big. So that is actually an optimized quantity. But the, <coughs> the marginal gains are small. So you can go to half as many to half the depth and you still get a good estimate. It's consistently a little bit worse, but it's not half as good, it's a lot better. So you can do with less depth if, for example, you need to save on data or on processing time. I mean, don't forget for this global map, we need to process something like 10 to the power of 12 pixels. So um, it will take a lot of compute power. And other architectural decisions, um, 
Well, I mean, you have to be careful with when you do the Bayesian deep learning, when you build this uh, log likelihood loss, you have to be a bit careful with the, with the numerics to make sure that you, 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 know, very, you treat very low and very high variances uh, correctly. So you clip off things a bit on the gradients and so on. But, but nothing, nothing on toward actually, we played with many architectures, most of them work, some work a bit better, but uh, we didn't find any adaptation also for the radar actually that would make things radically better than just feeding it to this uh, sort of hyper column type resonant architecture. Okay, thank you very much. So there's a question in the chat. Okay. Did you notice higher error rates for some type of vegetation cover? Um, so one has to be a bit careful with balancing. If, the, if there is something that is very rare, then CNNs or uh, discriminative learning engines in general will show their standard behavior and just ignore it because the error that you make by ignoring it is uh, fades in the general uh, loss. So if you have something that's very rare, it's good to give it a higher weight or you know, use more data augmentation on it or something. Other than that, we didn't see anything specific. As I said, um, one should definitely exclude urban areas. Um, so have a semantic label and not look at them because otherwise JEDI actually has no semantics. So it will just misrepresent them as tree heights. And that of course makes no sense because you're messing up your training data. If the images clearly see there's no vegetation response, but you say there's something 20 meters high. So those are a bit of an issue. Um, very, very low vegetation. So due to the restricted accuracy when you're measuring from space, you cannot do half meter or one meter bushes. There, the model gets very, very wobbly and, and essentially gives you this, you know, you're within the uncertainty range, but already at five meters, you get a pretty clear response. Actually there, it's fairly accurate. It's more so that very high vegetation the error goes up proportionally. So if you have a, say, 80 meter high tree, you probably have an error of more than 10 meters already, plus minus. But the okay. fact that certain biomes would be completely underrepresented, that sort of goes away by going large scale. The larger scale you go, the more everything is represented because the variability of the data set just grows. That's a big advantage of Jedi, actually, that you're not restricted to those local plots. Have we thought of ways to increase Jedi resolution by using airborne laser scan? Um, so super resolution of Jedi would be fairly hard because the shots are sparse. They don't overlap at all. And um, airborne laser scanning would, of course, be the gold standard. If you could use that as ground truth everywhere, you'd be better than Jedi even. But airborne laser scanning just doesn't scale because it's so expensive. You have to fly an airplane over all these areas, and that becomes pretty expensive very fast. So um, when you do that, we did that in Norway, use airborne LIDAR, where it's one country and a rich country, and they have a lot of forestry. So they do fly locally patches of LIDAR regularly. And there we use that as ground truth. And with that, we could get a lot more accurate even. But um, I think scaling LIDAR even just patch-wise, you know, with, with some regions as ground truth to the whole world would be very difficult at the moment. Just economically, you have to get there, you have to get permission to fly an airplane, you have to pay people to do that, you have to have a LIDAR instrument in it and so on. And that all um, can in theory be done, but probably um, it's difficult. And, and on top of that, I don't know, maybe the carbon footprint of that would be so gigantic that you destroy more biomass than you save. Okay, let's thank um, Professor Shinjono again. Thank you very much, Kono. Thank you for having me. So now let's uh, give the next section to uh, Professor Nanshu. Hello. So, um, in next, I will host the two oral presentations. 
Um, the first one is uh, a double head predictor based a few short object detection from area image. Uh, let's uh, welcome Stephen Wolf for his presentation. Yes, thank you. Give me a second to share the slides. Can you see the slides? Yeah, uh, not yet. Yes, yes, okay. it works. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Hello and uh, welcome to my presentation about doublehead predictor based few shot object detection for aerial imagery. My name is Stefan Wolf and this is a joint work with Mr. Meyer, Mr. Sommer, and Mr. Bayer. To motivate this work, I have an example where a few shot object detection should be applied. We can see a footage of a reconnaissance missions in an emergency situation. In such situations, it is necessary to get a quick overview of the scenario, including the position of the emergency units. However, they can be very specialized and uh, due to the urgency in such situation, it is difficult to collect enough data to train a traditional object detector, which requires a lot of data. Thus, uh, few shot object detection is a relatively recent uh, research topic that tries to enable the training of object detectors with only a small amount of samples. So the, the amount of samples needed can be uh, collected during such a uh, mission. In uh, recent years, there were a couple of approaches proposed for this uh, task. And uh, I want to introduce shortly the two stage fine tuning approach, which is one of these, since uh, our work relies on it. The TFA is based on faster RCNN and uses a two-stage training procedure. So in the first stage, there's a regular faster RCNN training on a set of base classes. For these base classes, there is an abundant amount of training data. And the target of the base training is to train a feature extractor that is uh, really capable of distinguishing many classes. So this is uh, the uh, basis for the Second stage, was, which is the few shot fine tuning. In the few shot fine tuning, the novel classes are added to the predictor. So, after the predictor should uh, be able to detect the base classes as well as the novel classes. For the novel classes, we only have few shots in this training uh, stage. However, also a few shots is only used for the um, for the base classes to get a, a, a balanced set of training data. To prevent overfitting, the feature extractor is fixed, so the weights aren't adapted. Only in the predictor, the last layer of, for the classifier and reg regressor is trained. So we have improved this uh, procedure by, with a uh, double head predictor architecture. So in the base training, we have the same procedure of training in faster RCNN. However, in the few shot fine tuning stage, we added a second head, which is only re responsible for predicting the novel classes. So the, 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 the base class predictor head is kept the same as in the base training, and we just add the second head. The, this uh, ensures that we don't uh, get a loss in uh, accuracy on the base classes. In the head for the novel classes, we not only train the, the last classification and the regression layer, but also the fully connected layer before. So we, we enable the network to adapt more towards the novel classes and yeah, have more parameters available for the task. Another optimization is that we unfreeze the 
RPN in the network. So the region proposal network this is an essential part of the fast ASEAN architecture since it uh, filters actual objects and uh, backgrounds. So if we have learned in the base training to always drop all um, objects not part of the base classes, we will not um, uh, can expect in the future fine tuning stage that uh, the RPN will predict the novel classes as objects since it was trained to predict them as background. And thus it is essential to unfreeze the region proposal network so that it can learn to um, also predict the novel classes as actual objects. Other improvements we did are in the regard of the sampling strategy. Traditionally, um, as I've mentioned at the beginning, uh, TFA uses the same amount of um, training data for base and novel classes during the future fine tuning stage. So we have always uh, just K annotations per class. This has a problem does it, that it unnecessarily limits the variance in the base classes. So base class variance could be a lot higher since we have abundant data available. Thus, we introduce a base shot multiplier. So we pick five times as many data for the base classes as we do for the novel classes to increase the data set diversity. However, this leads to a new problem since we have now an unbalanced training with uh, five times as many data for the base classes. To, um, yeah, to, to prevent this, we introduce a novel class oversampling factor, which just duplicates the images with the novel classes. So in total, we have a balanced training, but with a high diversity in the base classes. Another improvement regarding the training procedure is that we use all images, uh, all annotations uh, for an image. Um, this might sound weird, but uh, TFA only uses a single annotation per image. This means that if there's more than one annotation per image, they either um, drop the annotation because it's not in the set of data, or they duplicate the image and present the image multiple times to the network, each time with a different uh, ground truth annotation. And obviously this leads to slow convergence and unstable training. With, the, with our strategy to ensure that all annotations we have available for an image are always used during training, we can get a faster and more stable train. We have evaluated our novel approach with the ISET dataset, which is an aerial image dataset, which has uh, 2,800 images and over half a million annotations, which are categorized in 15 categories. We follow the standard pre-processing procedure. So we are um, taking 800 by 800 uh, crops in a sliding window approach. The available classes, have we, we have split them in um, two sets in the base classes and novel classes. For the novel classes, we have used three classes, baseball diamond, soccer ball, field, and roundabout. All other 12 classes are used as base classes. In the manuscript, we have also experiments um, with more than yeah, with, with other splits. However, in the presentation, I will only show results for, for the split. First on, I want to present our relation studies. We have started with the two short uh, two stage fine tuning approach and have applied our improvements uh, regarding the training strategy and the sampling. And we can see that, that this leads to a slight improvement in the base classes and also to a slight improvement in the novel classes. However, the really big improvements for the novel classes are from unfixing the region proposal network and also employing the double head predictor architecture. 
which uh, overall more than doubles the accuracy for the novel classes. This is mainly due to the increased recall, as we can see in the uh, precision recall curves. There, the TFA only has 50% recall at the maximum, while we have over 80% recall. We have also compared our approach with other state-of-the-art approaches. We have uh, used uh, the TFA as comparison and also the FS Dead View, which is a meta-learning-based approach which uses a meta branch to um, you know, the, uh, the architecture is especially targeted towards future object detection and to fastly predict. Uh, or fastly train novel classes. This can also be seen on the accuracy where the novel classes are predicted really good with, um, with the FS dead view, while on the base classes, FS dead view has a poor performance. Uh, in contrast, EFA is really good on the base classes while it is not that good on the novel classes. In contrast, our approach is also a good performance on novel classes as well as base classes. We have also generated qualitative results. There we can see that the TFA and the FS dead view, they miss the baseball diamond as well as both missing each of the soccer ball fields. Here's another image where TFA again misses the um, baseball diamond and FS dead view misses the soccer ball field. We can also see that uh, TFA is, has a poor localization accuracy since has a lot uh, or a large uh, margin around the soccer ball field. To conclude the presentation, we proposed a novel double head predictor architecture, which offers a more accurate future object detection, especially in aerial images. We have also found out that the sampling strategies are a really important aspect, which uh, is not yet really considered in the literature. Overall, our new approach outperforms state-of-the-art future object detection algorithms in aerial images. And for the future research, we plan an in-depth analysis of the impact of the category split. And uh, we also want to uh, test more data augmentation to increase the data set diversity. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy or I look forward to answer your questions. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Uh, is there any questions? Okay, I would like to ask a question. Uh, uh, what's the difference between the you know, future of object detection in area images and in the na nature images? Mm, I think one of the biggest difficulties is that in aerial images, we have a lot or a really high variance in terms of ground sampling distance. So the, the same object can be two by two pixels for a car, or it can be uh, 100 by 100 pixels. And this makes it really difficult for the uh, few shot approach, which, um, which basically needs to um, yeah, it needs a lot of variance in the data or in the, uh, to learn the different scales. Um, this is, I think, also a, pro a problem of the FS dead view, which, uh, if I remember correctly, does not uh, include a feature pyramid network and thus has a is not that good in terms of um, scale uh, invariance. Okay, okay, thank you. Is there any questions? No, we have, okay. 
<laughs> I, I think uh, uh, thanks, Stephen, uh, for his Thank presentation. You. Okay. Uh, okay, let's welcome the next presentation from uh, Xiaochen Zhen. Uh, his title is Self Supervised Pre Training and Controlled Augmentation Improve Real Wide Life Recognition in UAV Image. Thank you, Professor Xiao. Uh, can, you see, uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the presentation. The title of this work is self-supervised pre-training and controlled augmentation improve real wildlife recognition in UAV images. I'm Xiao Chen Zheng. I'm the master student at the ETH Zurich. And this work was part of my master thesis at the ETH and the EPFL. This work was collaborated with Benjamin, Ray, Irina, and Davis. For ecosystem protection, it is important to assess living conditions and potential survival risks of wildlife species by wildlife monitoring. In the past, identifying and counting animals in remote areas has, become, has been carried out manually. It is dangerous and inefficient. Since recently, this manual service of wildlife reserves are increasingly replaced by UAV imagery technologies paired with supervised deep learning models. This is a 3,000 times 4,000 pixel bird view UVV images of a national park in Africa called Kuzikus. Please have a look at the picture and I will give you a few seconds and try to find animals in the image. It's very hard to find them, right? And here are the ground truth notations labeled by our experts. As we can see, the good news is we now have access to an impressive amount of data acquired by the UAV. And the bad news is large amount of animals need labeling and the labeling remote sensing images is hard and expensive. Our approach, our, our purpose is to reduce the need for bonding individual annotation. To reduce the requirement of labeling a promising direction to this end is to use self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning, which uses raw image data and, uh, and available pretext data as its own supervision, has become increasingly popular because the cost of labeling has become higher and the inability of supervised model to gener generalize beyond their training data has become apparent. Different pretext tasks have been proposed with different transformation such as context prediction, rotation prediction, solving puzzles, and the instance discrimination. We choose our baseline model, uh, momentum contrast MOCO. MOCO is based on the perspective of contrast learning as dictionary lookup. And MOCO also applies instance discrimination as its pretext task. In the model, the anchor data, the anchor data goes into query encoder and the feature Q is encoded. At the same time, positive samples together with negative samples go into the K encoder and generate positive Ks and negative Ks. Positive and neg negative Ks are stored in the dictionary. And the dictionary is updated every batch to be kept as consistent as possible. The K encoder is slowly updated by the query encoder with the momentum mechanism. They are not completely separated, but related. The query and the case compose the contrastive loss. There is one, one of the two main technical challenges when applying MOCO to our data set. Most contrastive models are trained on curated data set with unique characteristics, such as ImageNet. In this data set, image contains only one single object which is located in the center of the image. And the object has discriminative visual features. The data sets also have uniformly distributed classes. In contrast, same image data sets like our Kuzikus data set contain highly correlated samples with highly similar visual features. For example, 
um, foreground color in red contains animals and background color uh, in blue does not contain animals. A and uh, D, C and E are very similar, but they are from different categories and it's very hard to distinguish. This will cause a problem of false, false repulsion. So what is false repulsion in MoCo? After loading a mini batch of images, the anchor data generates positive samples by data augmentation. And the negative samples are from different images. There are, there are three entries in negative samples from the same category with positive samples colored in red. So MoCo will attract between anchor and the positive samples and the repeal anchor and the negative samples away. The problem is when we have samples from the same category, which are repealed by MoCo, because we want our encoder to generate similar features from different images in the same class. So this will cause a problem of false repulsion. How to deal with the false repulsion? Here we have the same scenario. After encoded by the encoder, image representations here, both positive and neg neg negative samples are clustered by a local, local k-means algorithm. And the, the centroids of all clusters are computed. We store both centroids and anchor features. And then contrastive loss, contrastive model uh, attract anchor features and the centroid of its assigned cluster and repeal another uh, anchor features away from the rest centroids. So there will be less false negative, negative samples in our model. Here is a comparison of CLD and MoCo. CLD, as we can see in the picture, does not have the K encoder and dictionary. And also CLD performs local clustering for a batch of instances to find the centroids with anchor instance assigned to the centroid, uh, to certain centroid. Instead of directly using features to build contrastive loss, CLD applies contrast, contrastive loss between features between features and the centroids. There is another challenge when applying self-supervised learning to Kuzi Kuzi dataset. For example, by arbitrary rotation, the animal is uh, the animal in the UAV, UAV images is still an animal. We can tell that the features of remote sensing images in latent space should be rotation invariant. And in other words, our model should learn rotation invariant features to obtain good performance. How to capture uh, geometric invariant information? Inspired by invariant, invariant mapping, we add a symmetric branch to MoCo and CLD. And we aim to use this extra branch to learn a geometric invariant mapping. Then we perform MoCo and CLD algorithm between those two branches. How to design the algorithm to learn the geometric invariant mapping? Inspired by the MoCo V2, we add one extra branch, which is augmented uh, by a geometric uh, transformation. Here, we apply the random rotation. These are the PyTorch-like augmentation methods we used in uh, MoCo V2 and our proposed models. Here is our proposed model. Uh, Moco, Moco Geo. Um, it is just simply uh, adding an actual branch, geometric transformation branch to the original Moco model. And also our proposed, uh, another model which proposed by our work is a uh, GeoCLD. And we, we simply add the geometric trans transformation branch to the CLD model together combine the CLD model with the Moco model. So, here are the object recognition results on our data dataset. We verify different models by applying linear classification on encoded image representation. The linear classifier is a fully connected layer followed by softmax. We train the models without any separation for 200 epochs and record the accuracy, precision, and recall of the linear classification. In order to reduce the label requirement in the downstream task, we only use 10% labels 
to change the linear cl classifier. So first two entries are result using ImageNet pre-trained models, and the lat latter is a fine-tuned end-to-end. We can tell from the result that simply applying um, self-supervised models like Moho V2 will have worse performance, but our GLCLD self-supervised pre-training can outperform the supervised end-to-end -end fine tuning by about 5%. And our models are better performed than the SOTA model like Moho V2 and the CLD. Here is a training process and we, we, uh, we record the accuracy and the, uh, we, we record the accuracy every 10 epoch. We can see that at a very early stage with the CLD and the geometric transformation, models perform better than MoCo CLD, uh, sorry, than MoCo V2. Here is the TSNE visualization. From the TSNE visualization, we can tell that our model like GeoCLD have earlier and better separation between two classes. Those two classes, which contains animals and not contain animals, are indicated by the dot color here, uh, blue and red dot. So our conclusion is uh, the contrastive self-supervised pre-training with domain-specific geometric transformation outperforms out the, uh, the performance of fine-tuning image net pre-trained model with four labels. Results show that the geometric environment mapping method in our, mod, uh, in, our, in our work, feature level combination with geometric transformation can capture information more efficiently of wildlife in UAV images than method without geometric augmentation. If you, are, you, if you are interested, you can reach me through the email, Twitter, or GitHub. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, it, it, are there any questions? Mm. Uh, okay, uh, due to the time limit, uh, I, uh, I would like to skip the uh, question. Mm. So, uh, thanks, Shouting Jim, for his presentation. In the next, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Deng Xinbai. Uh, and, uh, before he gave us the talk, I would like to take a moment to introduce the next, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Dai. Uh, Dr. Dai is a senior researcher at MPI for Informatics, where he has the research group vision for autonomous systems. He also works with the computer vision lab at ETS Zurich on the research project Chess Zurich for autonomous driving. Uh, before that, uh, previously he obtained his PhD at uh, ETH Zurich under the supervision of Professor Luke Van Gogh and uh, Professor Gerhard Schmidt. Uh, his current research interests include the robot, uh, robust uh, perception algorithms, lifelong deep learning, <clears throat> sensor fusion, multitask learning, auditory perception, and uh, math based uh, perception. In the next, let's give time to Dr. Dai uh, for his presentation or citizen of semantics and understanding. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. So can you hear me or is it everything yes. okay? That's good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for inviting me here to give the talk. So then I mostly actually talk about our work uh, on all, all season semantics and understanding. Yes. So so this is actually not really specifically on uh, satellite image processing, but I hope that some of the technology can be also used there. So yeah, so let me start. No, this talk is also re related to remote sensing. Okay, so. Yeah, 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 thanks. So, so uh, yeah, a few words about myself. So yes, uh, as just introduced, I did my PhD at DTH Zurich. So later on as postdoc, as senior scientist there. So now I'm moving to MPI to start my own group uh, called Vision for Autonomous System. Uh, so the aim of the group, I mean, okay, we can also, I mean, it's kind of related to today's topic. So one of the topic is actually to train uh, our, to actually train our model for different uh, weather lighting conditions and also to, for different domains, let's say 
real synthetic. But I hear, here I think what is relevant could be these weather conditions because for like, for instance, satellite image processing, we can also have different weather conditions. Hopefully our trained model can be robust enough to process all these conditions, right? So that's why, I mean, I actually put this diagram here, but there are also other parts, like for instance, how to combine different type of sensors, how to combine different type of learning stream and uh, learning strategy, like semi-supervised, supervised learning, and also how to combine multitasks with multitask learning. So I will focus on this weather condition and different domain for today's talk. Okay, so if you look at the, the current benchmark, I mean, either it's for street view or for like uh, the satellite image processing, you can see that the number actually have been improved quite a lot in the last few years. So the question we ask ourselves is, have we solved all this problem, right? We also see like uh, this kind of autonomous driving car running on the public road, like quite successfully. Um, but when we look at them carefully, we find all these benchmark and demos, we actually put them, this is uh, all from quite fair weather condition. We have very nice lights and we don't have poor weather. It's not night time. So if you look at the reality, we have a lot more interesting like weather condition. For instance, we can have heavy rain, we can have night time. If we actually apply a model train on this fair weather condition, you see that the performance is quite good, right? If we apply to this bad weather condition, then the performance drop a lot. You see like here, now this is not good enough for autonomous driving or for any other you know, uh, autom automated applications. For instance, here is another example. If you apply this model to nine time, you see that the performance is also very bad. So this is actually, this uh, give us like highlight the, 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 the potential problem that we, we could have for all these weather condition. That is only for camera. We know that, I mean, for different application, we have multiple sensors that can be used, right? For instance, here we have the LADA. If you look at the LADA, for instance, the LADA data here, for this clear weather condition, we see the patterns quite clearly. We can even recognize, okay, this is a road, maybe other type of object, we can detect them quite accurately these days. But when we have fog, for instance, or rain or snow, other type of bad weather condition, then the, the, the data will be affected quite a lot. You see here, the visibility is, is kind of shortened, like you only have a short visibility. We also have quite some noise, right? So because the the backscattering reflection from the water particle in the air, we can get a lot of noise there. So in the end, we also need to, you know, handle this kind of domain gap due to this uh, different weather condition or lighting condition for LiDAR sensor as well. Okay, here's just a slide to highlight what is, I mean, what is happening in the, in the, in the, in the literature. So we have quite a lot of large benchmark for instance, cityscape, mapillary. Yeah, I'm sure that for our satellite image processing, we also have lots of great uh, benchmarks there, but then most of them actually are focused on this uh, quite fair weather condition so that we can make good progress for this, let's say the most standard or, or rather like a common, common situation. But then we also have a lot of other conditions, very challenging conditions like fog, rain, nighttime, or this clear, or even actually this strong contrast if you drive outside of a tunnel, right? So, or you can have very different objects that then what you have in your training data, some object you have never seen during your training data. You also want to be robust to this kind of change, right? So that is actually the focus of the, one of the focus of, uh, the research in my group uh, to handle this data set bias or this domain discrepancy. Okay, so how can we learn to generalize? So the idea is of course using this domain adaptation to train on the source and to test on the target. I, I think these days, I mean, we might have heard a lot of uh, discussion about domain adaptation. So the general idea is that during training time, you have this source domain data, you have the data from, let's say, the data from source domain, you have label, this is a distribution. This distribution is different from the distribution where you get, uh, you get from the target domain, for instance, this one. So you want to train on the, uh, you want to train on the source side then apply your model to the test side so that it can still work there, right? So let's say for this uh, semantic segmentation task for autonomous driving here, we can create a lot of annotations here. Um, we can train a neural network, we can get good performance, but 
if you apply the same recipe to all other conditions, for instance, all other conditions, that is too expensive to scale, right? You, you can imagine we have a lot more conditions. It's even harder to create annotations in some of these conditions. So this is this is not possible to, to let's say, do the same like uh, ask human to annotate all the data for every condition. So we need to have all kinds of uh, domain adaptation to make the model robust. Okay, in today's talk, I will actually go through a few of the techniques that we have developed in the, in the past years. So the first one we call this reliable domain adaptation. So when, you, when it, it is able to simulate some training data for your target domain, we just need to do it because it's reliable. It's actually somehow more predictable, interpretable. We have the, the, a lot of benefits. So I will give you some example. For instance, I mean, here we actually have the clear weather data. I mean, you have the stereo camera, you have left, right image, and you can estimate the depths. This is raw depths. I mean, there are some missing parts, some, some, this is some noise there you want to complete and denoise this depth map. Then later on, you can add, for instance, a fog effect into this image. So the idea is that you use some physical model, you know, how actually fog, real, the light react to fog, the, the presence of fog there. And then you can write down this equation to actually add the uh, fog into this image so that it looks like real fog, right? So by doing this, you can synthesize this fog of different density. You can really synthesize very light fog, medium fog, and very dense fog. So you can control how much fog you want to add there. And by doing this, we have a lot of training data. We can actually train a model for object detection or semantic segmentation, then we can apply this to real fog, right? So this is a quite a typical supervised training. So when you have the, the foggy data, because this clear weather data, they have annotation, right? We already have the annotation from existing data set. We can actually train a model. Then the next step we find is that we can even use some unlabeled clear weather data. For instance, this is the, some unlabeled sequence that you have recorded. We don't have the, the, the body to annotate, but we can also use this data. For instance, we can actually enforce the consistency between the prediction of these two image. Because these two image, I mean, the, it's actually the same, same physical thing behind, right? So the prediction out of these two image should be consistent because this is a car, here is also a car, although we have four there, right? So we can, we can have this image pair, that we can actually enforce the consistency there to define another law so that we have a similar surprise learning method so that we can have a better prediction. All right, so this is about this example. So by doing this, we can improve the recognition performance quite a lot without using any human annotation for real foggy data. For instance, here's some real fog data we have collected. We have annotated this ground truth. As you can see, like we can improve the performance quite a lot. Uh, by using our like a simulated uh, fog. Okay, I mean, that's just for image, but for LIDAR, it's actually the same. So if you look at the LIDAR, so let's say you put the LIDAR sensor into fog that you see here, this is, I mean, this is an image. And then for LIDAR, you see like we can have quite some noise, like for instance, uh, this uh, different uh, reflection from the water particle in the air. See, this could be like, uh, actually you can get some false detection out of this kind of uh, uh, noisy noisy point cloud. Yeah, by the way, this is a work actually also in ICCV. So like, if you are interested, uh, feel free to join our, our post discussion that we have code also available for this work. So yeah, I mean, I just give a highlight a summary, but if you are interested, please come to our, our post to visit. Okay, so, um, the idea is actually also to train this uh, 3D object detection method, the later based method, so that it can be robust for to fog, let's say. But the problem is that in the in the literature we don't have such a large data set because collecting a large data set uh, in real fog or in real rain is quite challenging. Like we only have one data set, this uh, seen through fog data set, where the people actually. This is a colleagues from, from Daimler that drove this car to Sweden for like two or two months to, to actually collect the foggy data. But this data is very nice for evaluation. They are still not efficient and they are still not sufficient to train a model. So the amount of data is still rather limited to train a, a, a sophisticated neural network. So we use the same idea. So basically 
to simulate fog effect into LIDAR point cloud so that we have kind of synthetic foggy LIDAR data so that we can train a, 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 a a stronger, like a more robust uh, um, LIDAR based 3D object detection method, then we evaluate them on real folk. That, that, that is the idea. So you see here, we use the existing data set. They, have, they already have the 3D bounding box annotation. And we can turn them into this uh, foggy weather situation. So we basically add two types of uh, fog effect. One is that the attenuation of this, um, or the magnitude of this signal can be uh, like reduced by having fog because the fog can reduce the visibility. So some uh, the magnitude of the signal of each point can be reduced. This is the attenuation. Then another thing we need to simulate is the uh, backscattering. So you have some fog which can give you some false uh, returns, right? So you you lay laser actually hit the water drop and can get some reflection. You thought it's an object, but it is not, right? So this simulation, I mean, we have a quite uh, a lot of uh, uh, precise mass formulation in our paper. So the idea is that you have to consider this uh, return of soft target, uh, return of a hard target, also the shape of a laser, uh, of a laser pulse, for instance, in this shape, then also the position of the transmitter and the receiver of the laser sensor. So in the end, you put all this together, then you can have a simulation algorithm to turn this into a foggy data. So if you train an algorithm on this foggy data, we can see that our method can improve the performance of multiple 3D object detector in foggy situation. You see like, for instance, here's multiple 3D object detection, trained our clear laser, then trained on our fog simulation. You see that we can really improve the performance quite a lot, especially for the dense fog, right? I mean, here is a real dense fog. We evaluate the, on the real fog. So, Okay, so here's just a real result. You see like by training on our data, you see that some false detection will be removed. So we can get some uh, quite nice uh, decent improvement. Okay, so just to summarize this line of work. So certain that the weather phenomena can be actually simulated quite, quite accurately by using a physics-based method. And by doing this way, we can actually turn the existing data set, like some of the existing data set collected in clear weather, we can turn them into the adverse weather data set. And we can train all this data set to have more reliable domain adaptation. All right, so the, there are also some benefits, uh, some, some drawbacks of this method. So not all the domain characteristics can be rendered in such a way very accurately. So this is just some example where we know the equation, okay, how to formulate them, but there are more general domain gaps that we cannot write down the equation. So we can also in this way. That's why we need other methods. So the second method I, I, I'm going to talk is, is more general like domain adaptation method you can apply to, to like more general domain adaptation task. This is adversary domain adaptation. I think this is a very popular approach already. I mean, uh, uh, developed a few years ago in the, in the literature. So it's to align the domain in the reputation space. So I mean, here I just use a few slides from uh, Rudy Hoffman to actually introduce a bit of background here. So you have the data from your source domain that you actually have passed through a neural network, a feature vector, you can train a classifier to actually distinguish these different classes. And then for the target domain, you have a, like, of course you have different uh, data, right? So you have a domain gap here. You see you have some background, like different type of background that you pass through the same network. You have a feature, feature vector, but here you don't have a label to train this classifier, right? So to actually train the uh, classifier, but instead you want to train a kind of domain uh, a confusion module to actually bring these two feature rotation together. So I will show you actually later on in, in a few slides. So during this training, you have basically have two type, two type of parameters. So the first one is to train this uh, network with the label data on the source domain. So this is your classifier. This is all about this uh, two classifier like on the source domain, you train this one, train a classifier on the source domain. And the second step is actually to train a domain classifier to distinguish these two domain. You try to, I mean, train classifier to see whether I can distinguish these two domain. And then, and then you can train a feature network to confuse the domain classifier. So basically 
you want to generate the features from these two domains such that your domain classifier cannot distinguish, okay, it's from source or target domain. That means the feature are quite well aligned uh, between these two domains, right? By doing that, that uh, your classifier, which has been trained on the source domain, can be very applied to the target domain. So that was the idea. So basically, during the training, you just you know uh, actually iterate over these uh, three steps. You have classifier training on the source domain. You train a domain classifier, fix it. Then you actually train the feature reputation to confuse this classifier. So somehow you actually uh, go through this loop. Okay, so this is a overall picture of this uh, kind of adversarial learning for image classification. This has been very, very popular, but at 2018, like we proposed the first uh, domain adaptation method for object detection using deep neural networks. So basically we introduced this domain adaptation uh, adversarial learning idea for object, for object detection. So here we have an image, we can go through the convolutional network, we have a feature map, we can have some region proposals to have these regions, right? So this is a region proposal. Now, of course, this region proposal can be further fit into the, the subsequent network to get a classification score, to have regression to correct, basic to correct the position of this bounding box. So what we did is that we introduced, I mean, we can have this image level adversary learning block as we just introduced, but in the meanwhile, we can also have the adversarial learning blocks on this at the instance level. So this instance level, we can also have, have the adversarial learning blocks. So the idea is that you also, I mean, you can align the image feature at image level, but you can also align the feature reputation at object level. Let's say the car, the feature from car instance should be also aligned with the feature from car instance from a different domain, right? So that is the idea. That you can also in, enforce the consistency between these two type of alignment. So one is instance level, one is image level. So this is a paper we published CVPR 2018. I mean, uh, which has actually uh, inspired uh, quite some uh, following up work. Then this year for this IDSCV work, we further extend this to multiple scales. So we know objects actually appear at multiple scales. Some of the small objects can be detected at these high resolutions. A bigger object should be detected at this low resolution feature map. Then we just apply this to multiple scale, try to also align the features of the object at different scale, right? So for instance, uh, larger as a smaller object at smaller objects, uh, the feature rotation of smaller objects should be aligned at this, this scale, the media size object, this scale, then the, 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 the larger objects should be aligned at this scale. So by doing this, that we actually get uh, quite a big improvement for this domain adaptive object detection. And we can see that uh, compared to quite some of other methods that we have, the, 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 we have much better performance. So the method can be used to actually adapt from normal weather to adverse weather, or can be used to adapt from it's a normal, like a natural image to this cartoon star image. So it's quite a generally applicable method. So to summarize this, this line of work with adversarial domain adaptation, so it's a very flexible setting. You only need to have an unlabeled data set from the test domain, right? You don't need other, other, and you don't need more than that. So the problem formulation is also quite clean, like it's uh, very grounded. Uh, it's quite effective for uh, many general domain adaptation cases, but the drawback is that the training can be unstable sometimes. And also it doesn't work well for large domain gaps. So we, I call this extreme domain adaptation. So if you have like very large domain gap, then it's quite hard to make them work. That's why we need some other technology here. So I call this extreme domain adaptation. So we need to build up kind of a domain flow to actually connect the source domain like uh, through multiple stage to the target domain. So let's see how, how this is, uh, can be done. So. Uh, because this line work, we rely on some kind of self-training. So I, I actually use a few words to introduce uh, what is self-training, which is, I mean, very, anyway, it's very simple. So you have some data, so this labeled training data, you can train a classifier here. Then on the unlabeled data, you can generate some pseudo label, right? Then you can have pseudo label selection. Maybe you select the most confident prediction then you actually augment your training data, you add more training data, right? So, I mean, here, of course, you have some mistakes there, but hopefully most of them are correct. So you can 
have a larger training data you retrain, then you actually make prediction again on the unlabeled data set. You, you actually make a, uh, some more selection that keep, keep actually uh, augmenting your, your training data. So that is the idea of self-training. So, okay, let's come back to this domain flow. So for this extreme domain adaptation, let's say from daytime directly to nighttime, you see the domain gap is quite big. You have motion blur, you have this, uh, let's say, uh, low light region, you have this high, really, really strong light region. You also have, I mean, the, sometime you have um, this uh, noise uh, at nighttime, uh, quite, quite a lot of uh, uh, different reasons contribute to this domain gap, right? So instead of directly transfer them from here to here, then we can build up a chain of domain, intermediate domain, right? So if you drive, let's say we drive a car, or if our satellite, I mean, keep uh, actually taking photos of uh, the, some cities or some 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 mountains, and I mean, during night time, uh, during this twilight time, let's say the evening time, going through daytime, like about two hours to night time, we have this like continuously changing domain, right? You see, getting a bit darker, darker, and darker. Then we can actually use this data to help us to transfer the, the knowledge. You see here, the domain gap between each of them is actually small, much smaller, right? That means that knowledge can be transferred uh, much easier. And then for fog, it's the same, like or for rain, snow, we, we, have, we, we, we can have very dense fog or rain, but very often we also have light rain or light fog. We have medium fog, we have dense, and we have a very dense fog. So we can also build up this chain of domain, uh, more like curriculum learning. You learn from the easiest thing, then you go slightly harder, harder, and, and move to the, the most difficult situation, right? This is a situation where you can collect data for the intermediate domain. So what happens if you cannot collect data for, for some of the situation? Uh, that's why we actually introduced another method in this IGC paper this year. So basically, you have the source domain, you have the target domain. We want to synthesize uh, the, the image of the intermediate domain. So we introduce this latent variable and improve the cycle gain model so that you don't only translate from source domain to the target domain, like uh, basically have this binary translation. But we actually introduce this uh, hidden variable. We can really control, okay, we can generate an image which more like source image, but still sample looks like the, the target image, or we can do the other way around. We can generate an image which looks more like target image, but still contain a bit of the source style, right? So this is actually the idea. So you can use this method really to generate like a intermediate domain for uh, in any general like two domains, right? You have source domain, you have an unlabeled data set here. Sorry, you have a labeled data set here. And here you have an unlabeled data set. But here for the translation, anyway, we don't use labels. So, so somehow you say here you have a collection of source image, here you have a collection of target image. You can do this type of translation to synthesize a lot of image in between. Then you can use this image to help you to transfer the semantic knowledge. Okay. By doing this kind of curriculum self-training that we can actually improve the performance, for instance, for nighttime image recognition quite a lot. So this is a image we have collected. Again, the real nighttime image, this annotation we created to evaluate. Then compared to this standard domain adaptation, this is actually one of the adversary learning methods for domain adaptation. You see that our method can actually generate much better performance. So for this extreme domain adaptation, this adversarial learning method is not uh, robust enough to give us good result. Okay, to summarize this line of work, basically we can, I mean, data of this intermediate domains can be collected or synthesized. So we need just need to be smart enough to think about what, what could be the intermediate domains and we can collect either collect the data or we can try to synthesize some data in between so that the domain gap actually getting smaller and smaller, we take easy steps, right? So, okay. And the second one, the domain adaptations through this sequence of intermediate domain is, is a simpler task than if you go directly from the source domain to the target domain. So this line of work is very useful for large domain to close large domain, uh, domain gaps, uh, especially this kind of extreme domain adaptation. There are still like drawbacks in this line of work. So this pseudo label, because we actually rely on the pseudo labels, right? So we train a model, we 
generates a prediction on the unlabeled data set, then we actually somehow assume that this prediction is correct, right? But uh, we know that the prediction sometimes can be noisy. We will introduce some confirmation bias and, and, and then later on, we actually tend to only predict the easy class more and more, right? So of course there are already some technology uh, techniques there to somehow to address these issues, but still, I mean, there's a, there is a confirmation bias issue there. So that's why we probably also need some more help, um, and especially from the data and on the target domain to help us have more robust domain adaptation to of kind of avoid this uh, uncontrolled self-training. Because self-training, I mean, the more you actually iterate, then you can drift away, right? At some point, probably you don't have a full control of this, you probably can drift away. So one of the methods we studied is we call this uh, Domain adapt, robust domain adaptation with self-supervised auxiliary tasks. So if you can define some self-supervised auxiliary tasks on the target domain, uh, I mean, because these tasks, they don't need supervision, right? And then you can train on the target domain, which can give you an idea about how the data statistics and how the characteristic of the target data looks like. So this knowledge you can transfer to another, to your primary task, right? For your domain adaptation. So let's, let me give you an example. I mean, before that, probably I can use also this slide to introduce a bit of knowledge, background knowledge about multitask learning, because here we need at least two tasks. So multitask learning means that, I mean, you have the same input, you have a neural network, this is an encoder, you might have multiple decoders to get the output of like a multitask. For instance, here could be semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, and depth estimation. So in the end, I mean, the idea is to have one single network, which is smaller, runs faster, and hopefully also give you better result, right? Because uh, multiple, these multiple uh, tasks are trained together, their supervision can be shared, right? And the idea here is that, I mean, we can train this network with ground human annotated ground truths to have completely supervised tasks. But that's not the, the, the topic of uh, today's talk. So the we actually focused on the case where, I mean, for some of the tasks, we actually have self-supervision. Let's say for depth estimation, we know depth estimation can be, can be done just with a monocular image sequence, or if you have two stereo image pair, you can estimate depth, right? You, not necessarily, I mean, you don't need to have a human supervision all, all the time, right? So you can actually, we have ways to estimate depth without human supervision. So, if we have this source, we can self-supervise, then can we actually somehow translate, or oh, sorry, transform this uh, supervision through this network actually to improve the performance of semantic segmentation, right? So that is the uh, idea, especially across these different domains. So let me show you an example. This is also a work of this year's ICCV. So if you are interested, you can also visit our poster. We also made the code available. So. Uh, if you look at this example, we have image here, we have semantic label, we have depth labels. And if you see the result of these two tasks, we find that they are quite strongly correlated, right? So um, the age of the object, then also you see like, okay, I mean, you, we can almost recognize car or this uh, like a kind of tree, the road, I mean, quite, they're, they're strongly correlated. That means if this task can be adapted very well, then we can translate the knowledge to this task, right? But of course, this task can be, can be adapted very well because it's self-trained, right? I mean, during test time, it also can get self-supervision from the test time, uh, from the test domain, right? from target domain. So we can trans translate the knowledge. Okay, so if you put this all together, then for this setting, it's quite interesting. We have one more uh, like uh, input. So you see on the source domain, we have image, we have semantic annotations, but this time we also have depths, right? Then target domain, we have the input image. We don't have semantic uh, uh, supervision, but we also have depths, right? Depths is self-supervised, we also have depths. And how can we use all these five input to actually have a more robust prediction for the semantic map on the target domain, okay? So you see, as I said, that these depths can be estimated in an unsupervised manner. You have sequence of image, you can estimate depths, or you have stereo image, you can estimate depths. So this is way more adaptive than semantic segmentation. All right, so the idea of this work is to kind of trust, 
like uh, transfer the knowledge in two different ways. So the first one is that there's some correlation between these two tasks, like semantic and depth. So there's some form of a correlation between them. So we want to learn this correlation and then translate this to the target domain. So we assume that this correlation between these two tasks is domain invariant, right? So regardless of what domain you handle, then the correlation between these two tasks is, is, is actually should be transferable from one domain to another domain. The second idea we use that if you look at the same task, let's say depth estimation, then across these two domains, so there must be some correlation there, right? So how can we learn this uh, relationship and translate them to semantic segmentation? So somehow we know, okay, this one and this one also have a kind of a, 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 um, correlation. So we can also use the knowledge from here to improve this uh, semantic prediction on the target domain. So that actually is a tool type of uh, knowledge transfer we use. Okay, so let me uh, like uh, give provide a bit details about the first one. So we want to learn the correlation here, translate to here, and then. Um, okay, so okay, that's good. So what we use is actually we define this attention module. So we can go through this network uh, very, very quickly. So you have the source image, you have the target image. It goes through the same shared encoder network. Then we have the depth prediction network. Then we have the semantic prediction network. We can already have some initial prediction right here. You can predict the depth. Here you can predict the semantics. And this can be a one simple multitask learning network. Then it's, I mean, by itself, it can be used uh, on its own, right? But then this is not the end of the story. So we want to let the depth to help semantic and also semantic maybe to help depth. So, so we, we define this attention module. This is also kind of inspired by existing multitask learning network. So we can define this attention module to use the depth feature to improve the semantic knowledge. Then in the end, we can have a more refined prediction for both semantic segmentation and depth estimation. So the idea of this attention map is to actually learn some weighting function actually to, to let's say to figure out which uh, how do we use this or reweight these uh, depth features and going through a get function so that it can be added up to the semantic segmentation features in order to generate a more reliable, more robust uh, semantic segmentation feature. So this is actually the idea of this attention module. And when we apply them to, sorry, we actually will apply to our task because uh, the depth estimation can be self-supervised. So, so the, the supervision is mostly transferred from depth to semantics, right? So that is actually something for our task. So let me I think I have some connection problem. I cannot uh, move my slides to the next one. Mm. Okay, so it seems that uh, Oh, yeah, okay, sorry, that thing either is a connection or it's, yes, okay, that's good, I mean, we are back, so, okay, so the second one is actually to, to learn this uh, uh, relationship between these two depths maps, so what we learned here is that we learn for different image instances, what are the difficulty for the uh, adaptation, so for some instances, it might be easier to adapt. For some instances, it's probably harder to adapt, right? So this is similar to this curriculum self-training idea. So for some instance, which looks more similar to the source domain, which is easier, then we probably need to learn and make prediction first on this type of image, then we re relearn, right? So this is the idea we learn here. With this supervision, we can really figure out which instance is easier, which instance is harder. We can make this curriculum domain adaptation. So that is the second idea. If we put these two ideas together that we can find that our method can make like a more robust and like a, a better adaptation uh, performance. You see here the baseline is this one. Then we actually add these two contribution. When we put these two contribution together, we have the best performance. So we evaluate this on two standard benchmarks, this synthetic to real, like CNCR to Cityscape, GTA to Cityscape, our method get the best uh, result compared to many of other like uh, previous approaches. Okay, so um, 
The self-supervised auxiliary task can actually improve the performance of domain adaptation. Then we also find that we explicitly learn this correlation between depth and semantics. This, this can be very helpful for domain adaptation. And more importantly, that this type of technology can be used for test time domain adaptation. Let's say if you actually deliver like uh, your system to some situation you have never seen before, right? Then you actually start receiving the images there. Then during this test time, you hope that your network can be adapted there, right? So because you have a self-training task, then this can help you to transfer the knowledge to the primary task. Okay, the limit here is that this, this method is only evaluated on synthetic to real, a synthetic to real setting, not on the normal condition to the adverse weather or adverse lighting condition, right? And uh, this is mostly because in the in the literature we don't have a large data set for adverse conditions. And then due to this reason, we actually propose a new benchmark uh, called SETC data set. So I will actually introduce this data set uh, in a few slides. And uh, this is also working this ICC. We, uh, we also have the benchmark available. So if you are interested, you can already, I mean, it has been available already for, for some time. So for this data set, we have collected uh, four adverse conditions like nighttime, fog, rain, and snow. We have created pixel-wise uh, accurate annotations for this uh, 4,000 image. I mean, this annotation is quite challenging. So we need to spend like 3.3 hours per image. This is actually by a, a professional company to annotate this. So we, it is quite hard. So what makes it harder is that when we annotate, we have to also look at the, the video, like uh, because for adverse weather conditions, sometimes it's very hard to recognize object without looking at the video. So that is actually what we need to do. And we also have the daytime corresponding image. So basically we drive multiple times, we have a daytime corresponding image for each of these adverse, adverse image. So we can use that image to figure out, okay, under this snow cover, is it a road or, or sidewalk, right? So if you have a daytime image, then a clear weather daytime image, it can help you to create very reliable annotations. Even with the help of these two additional, like, you know, data, data source, then still we cannot actually annotate every pixel that they actually something very special to adverse weather condition. So in the end, we have to create a mask to indicate for some regions, even human cannot create accurate ground truth. So this is actually very good for us to evaluate. When we evaluate method, we have this kind of uncertainty awareness, right? So which part we are certain, which part we are not certain. So sample to make sure our evaluation makes sense, right? Okay, the data set is already available. You can download on the server. Then you can also submit the performance of your model to either to all the conditions or to one of these address conditions separately. Uh, so a few findings in this paper, we find that nighttime and snow is, uh, they are actually more challenging than fog and rain. Mostly, I mean, nighttime, of course, is uh, quite challenging because different uh, types of lighting source and they have uh, poor exposure, under exposure. And snow, probably mostly because of snow cover. If something is covered by snow, it's very hard to recognize, right? Then what we also find that adaptation performance, I mean, so far, mostly they are benchmarked on this synthetic to real setting. So they actually are not very, very correlated to this normal to adverse condition. So we evaluate eight of the top performing adaptation methods, then only one actually works for normal to adverse conditions. So that means we really need to have a more like a benchmark so that we, our methods don't all fit to one of the condition. Okay, so if we train like uh, our deep neural networks, like a very deep neural network, we find that this network can all fit to normal condition. If you train our cityscape, you train different type of network, we find the, the deeper one, the best performing network tends to all fit more to the normal condition. If you evaluate address condition, the best performing one actually can, you know, even drop more. Like, so that means that the, our method can be really all fit to those normal conditions. And we find that this kind of network, they have enough capability to handle multiple conditions. If you put multiple conditions together, adding more and more data, even they're from different conditions, but the network is able to handle all of them quite well. So that means at this stage, I mean, having more data 
even they are from different domains, they are, they are still helpful. Okay, so we also evaluate, find that the existing method for image dehazing, de-raining, low light enhancement, they, I mean, they don't help much for high level semantics in understanding tasks. All right, so that's uh, all my talk. So I mentioned the five of this uh, line of work, reliable domain adaptation by simulating some data with this uh, physics behind. If where is possible, you can simulate realistic data. We just do it because it's actually helpful. It's a kind of a, uh, uh, predictable. Then we have other third domain adaptation, which is a quite uh, flexible setting but it might not work for like a very like challenging situation. Then when it's possible to build up a domain flow for this curriculum self-training from the source step-by-step step, going through multiple intermediate domain to the target, then we just do it because it actually helps to transfer the knowledge. Then when it's possible to define some self-training tasks, self-supervised auxiliary tasks for domain adaptation, this can also be very helpful because the multiple tasks they are correlated, then the supervision can be transferred to the primary task, then it can help us to regularize the, 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 the neural network and help for the adaptation. Then in the end, we mentioned one of this new domain adaptation benchmark. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. That's, uh, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, Dr. Uh, thanks for Dr. Uh, for his presentation, and uh, uh, we we have about uh, two minutes to uh, answer uh, to uh, uh, answer questions. So, any questions? Hi, Dr. 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 I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Why image is the housing can be hard have for high level semantic segmentation? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat your question again? Uh, why image is the housing can hardly have for high level semantic segmentation? Oh, you mean image the housing? Why is that? Okay, yes. I mean, it can introduce, I mean, I think for the low level task, we have this uh, dehazing, we try to improve the visibility, but in the meanwhile, we probably lose some useful information for, I mean, lose some information which is crucial for high level tasks. Then we could also introduce some noise which uh, not visible to human, human eye, but this can be very like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, quite bad for the for the semantic high level semantic segmentation so somehow i mean like because this this dehazing network is trained separately right so you can lead to a suboptimal situation where the the, the 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 data is not optimal anyway for high level semantic segmentation so in the end i think that the the good idea probably to train this low level dehazing and high level semantic segmentation together so that you can have a Good. I mean, you can have a good uh, 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 image, like the has image. You can ha also have good uh, recognition result. I mean, so far, like people normally, I mean, uh, treat this as two separate tasks. Then your dehazing can lead to some, I mean, like a situation which is might not be optimal for for semantic segmentation, for instance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Any question? So, uh, I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like in terms of your experience with uh, autonomous driving, so how are uh, sensor fusion approaches like uh, uh, using uh, multimodal networks for uh, like using LiDAR data and uh, the image data for uh, uh, semantics uh, segmentation? Uh, would that help uh, in any uh, in any kind of uh, method? Yes, yes. I, I mean, that's, uh, this uh, good question. I mean, this multiple sensor fusion is actually a very important and big topic. Uh, people have used that for also photo adaptation. Like you can imagine, like uh, 
different sensors they have different uh, different level of robustness uh, with respect to different uh, domain change right for instance lidar is actually not very robust to weather condition but robust to lighting condition right i mean from daytime to nighttime the lidar is actually robust there so it can actually help the camera for instance you have a camera you have nighttime image you have a lot of domain change but but lidar is still okay right so uh, there already works actually a few works to use this uh, consistency for instance uh, if you have a lidar point here you have camera if they i mean you actually uh, record the same uh, same physical thing right so you have the lidar point if you project to this this pixel then you can enforce the semantic label from image and also from lidar point cloud so so that they can be consistent consistent they need to be consistent right so by using this consistency, you actually your method can be more robust to this domain change. So somehow your method is able to transfer some knowledge from the more robust sensor to the less robust sensor. So yeah, I mean that's that's actually just one example. If you use radar, like uh, it, it's it's even more robust, right? But but then the, the challenge there is that the sensor have a very low resolution, can have very noisy points, and how can we actually in somehow effectively integrate the information from this different type of sensor that 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 is a challenge but but it's a very interesting open research direction uh, yeah i think that's uh, we definitely should look into that area more okay uh, thank you so much for that yeah, thank you thank you any question mm -hmm. I would like to uh, ask a question. Mm. <coughs> uh, because the input uh, data are actually visual uh, data, right? So, mm. Uh, mm, uh, what is the key factor that uh, can uh, do the high level uh, vision tasks from uh, by using the four images or uh, <coughs> or ring image? Uh, I, I think uh, because uh, I think uh, the data, uh, training data is important, but uh, uh, I, uh, because in the foggy, foggy image, uh, people usually uh, cannot uh, see anything. So uh, what's the visual cues uh, uh, of, uh, 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 affect the final results? Uh, you mean like... Uh... Yeah, if I understand your question correctly, so basically, you mean, for instance, in this foggy situation, human don't see much there. So, what are the yes. we cues in then that is is used uh, for recognition, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's actually a very good point because I mean, for human annotation, like for instance, we cannot see certain part, but then the question is, can machine actually learn to recognize, right? So we believe that machine probably can learn it because I mean. We don't see something, it doesn't mean that there's zero information there, right? It's just, I mean, we might, I mean, if you change, for instance, this image, if you change the contrast a bit, then if you adjust, I mean, use some kind of a enhancement method, maybe we will see something that we don't see right now, right? So uh, there's some, probably there's still some information there, and we don't see it, then the network is able to learn to learn from this very subtle, like uh, uh, some subtle cues to recognize the object even behind this uh, the fog. So, yeah, I mean, this is based on neural network, right? We don't know actually what they have learned. So, so we just know that if we use this uh, low contrast uh, foggy image to train the network, then the network is able to at least have better performance to recognize object uh, at distance, right? Even, even they are kind of blurry, and and low low contrast, then the network is still able to learn so to 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 recognize it. So, but we don't know like what feature specific lens there. Most likely because they actually learn some kind of a enhancement uh, uh, in the, try to enhance the, the 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 contrast a bit so that the, the information gets uh, like a more more obvious, right? But we don't know exactly like what kind of feature they have learned. I mean, especially when we use neural networks, it's very hard to figure out what exactly is learned there. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah.
we have one minute, we have one minute left. So any questions? Yeah, as I said, I mean, some of this work is actually the ICCV work uh, in this ICCV. So in the in this week, that uh, if you are interested, just to check and visit our poster, the code uh, the code and data are already made available. So you can, I mean, have a look at them. Okay. Uh, thank you again. So, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we need to uh, uh, go to the next uh, session. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah great. Thank you. Bye. And the uh, next session is hosted by Dr. Ding. <laughs> Ding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next report is represented by uh, Chen Wei Tao. His talk title is uh, Get a Better One Pixel uh, Lady Care Correspondent Flow Networks for Roman Sensing Imagine Matching in High Resolution. Uh, I, he, he chose to uh, play our videos. Uh, Um, uh, use our work about the remote sensing image matching in higher resolution. We propose later scales called respondents of learning words to get a better one piece of PHK in higher resolution. The common pipeline for image imaging can be summed up as three stages briefly. One, future extraction, two, future imaging, and three, transformation model estimation. Remote sensing image imaging can also be sold by this pipeline. As shown in this page, the classical methods with the pipeline is shoot and INSAC and the KN and the list squares. Our pipeline is CNS and global or local correlation and normalization and dense cell supervised learning. We use PCK as the evolution metrics. Now let's know more about PCK. When the distance of a voltage point and its ground truth is smaller than sigma threshold, this voltage point is the correct key point. The percent of the mass image size is often used. Hello, everyone. Now I will introduce the physical methods with the shield pipeline is shield and INSAC and KN and list squares. Our pipeline is CNS and global or local correlation and normalization and dense cell supervised learning. We use PCK as the evolution metrics. Now let's know more about PCK. When the distance of a voltage point and its ground truth is smaller than sigma threshold, this voltage point is the correct key point. The percent of the mass image size is often used as this threshold. The higher tau and the resolution means the higher sigma. The higher sigma means more correct point. It's a relative number. In higher resolution, even we get a worse point. This point may be right because of this realistic threshold. If we say the sigma is absolute one, it will not increase with resolution, so it's a strict threshold and also more practical. We explore the relation of PCK and different resolution networks. We set five different highest scales. The lowest scale is filter. We can get a con Collusion from the results. The higher scale means the higher PCK. Absolute 
PGK is hard to keep in high resolution. High resolution of final regulation, they will be more efficient to keep absolute PGK than pure absolute. Now we know how to keep one pixel PGK in high resolution. The resolution of final regulation lay should be high, but high resolution also means more computational cost. How to keep or reduce future measure computational cost in high resolution? The resolution of machine lay should be low. For national images, Geometrical machine often means the same instance in different press with large displacement. Semantic machine often means the same class with smaller displacement. Most are in center. Both these two types of machine can make sure that the local similarity. But for remote sensing images with bigger semantic change, the correspondence pixels represent different land covers and are not similar in the most local areas. We design new words for this difference. To keep absolute one pixel PGK in high resolution, input images are resized to multi scales and then sent to new backbone to Generate multi feature pyramids. These pyramids are linked and efficiently pull up on the highest resolution of original backbone, just like later when the global correlation scale is fast at a low level. For both images with slight semantic change and the images with big semantic change, LACVN is consists of a flow pipeline to get a correspondence flow from cost to fine and a mask pipeline to correct long correlation and flow. Because of the difference local similarity, local correlation will be used or not. Now we introduce the flow pipeline of LACVN for slide semantic change. Firstly, we get a global correlation from future mass with lattice resolution at the first level. Then the correspondence flow decoder receives global correlation and initial zero correspondence flow as inputs. It outputs a course correspondence flow. This flow is then converted to optional flow by normalization. After our sampling, it works the next source feature map. The next work is the source feature map and the original target feature map will be sent to a local correlation line. Then we get a local correlation from this correlation line. The next optical flow decoder receives this local correlation and opts a optical flow. This optical flow will be refined by another optical flow decoder for the same temporary middle feature map. The refined optical flow will be added to the course. Optical flow. We repeat these steps by three times. The last optical flow will be upsumped to the resolution of original source images and wrapped the source image to get a final matching result. Meanwhile, a mask pipeline are correcting flow pipeline to get a more accurate matching. Mask decoders are Project to estimate the areas from course lay to fine lay. At first, a global mask decoder is plotted from global correlation. It shows only same parameters with flow decoders except for the last mask output lay. 
the after channel number of this way is sent to one. After our sample is master at a global level, we are masking the self correlation of the target future map at the current level with the concrete operator. Next, mask and the deformable displacement of current flow are generated from this masked self correlation. We pull two heads from it, one previous the next mask and one previous the current flow deformable displacement. The two heads show the most parameters except for the last one for efficient computation. Currently, from out of something will be worked by this displacement. Next mask will force the mask, next local correlation and modulator the original correlation based on the masked correlation. The final new correlation will be got similar with deformable convolution. So the original flow will be correlated by mask pipeline twice. Loss function of LS7S is consists of vertical flow loss and mask loss. We apply supervision every pyramid level using the end point area loss as flow loss. From the ground truth of flow, we can get a mask pyramid estimation the existence of correspondence. The original flow loss is routed by this mask. From the ground truth of flow and the prediction of flow pipeline, we get the ground truth of mask and use the weighted error normal as the loss function of mask pipeline. The slight semantic changes are not considered before, so we build a new dataset for training and evolution based on the dataset used for big semantic changes. We compare LSC1S with BioCNGO and use the best pre-trained model. Our method shows powerful results with strict distance. Furthermore, we try our LSC1S on TSS about a semantic correspondence task of natural image. We also get a commutative result without using inefficient action and city convolution. Compared with the images with slight Semantic change in the local correlation is hard to get the correspondence because the land covers in the most local areas are changed. Local correlation will bring new long result because we have no land cover levels to learn. The change of fungi land covers such as formal land with crops and formal land without crops also impairs. For flow pipeline, all local correlation layers are removed. Global correlation result will be refined by multi level correspondence flow decoders. We adopt the shared correspondence flow decoders. The first decoder also receives global correlation and the initial zero flow as inputs. Out of sampling, it works the next source fusion map and is sent to next flow decoder as the input. The next work is the source fusion map and the target fusion map are also sent to next flow decoder as the inputs. We repeat this step from the second decoder to the last decoder. The last decoder is in the resolution of original input images. We can get a better matching result in higher resolution in this cascade way. Every decoder is consists of five convolutional blocks and every convolutional block has different 
达雷逊·帕拉米德斯和迪乌伦的雷雷塞巴提维·菲尔德斯。All the imports of the gold will be concrete before conclusion. For master pipeline, we keep the most master pipeline used in LIC one is and just remove the module about local correlation. Loss function of LIC one B is consisted of the correspondence flow loss and the master loss. We use the same master loss with LIC1S. For flow loss, we apply supervision at every pyramid level using the low distance loss. Be all the former methods, LIC1B gets a very high PCK0 and get a better PCK, one piece of PCK in higher resolution. This is our contribution. Thank you. Thanks for the presented video from uh, Chen Weitong. Are there any questions? If there is no question, we will go to the next uh, presentation. The next uh, report is uh, presented by Lona. As uh, the talk title is uh, Progressive uh, Supervised Deep uh, Transfer Learning for Forest Mapping in Satellite Images. And that's welcome. Hello everyone, I am Numan Ahmed. I am here to present the paper Progressive Unsupervised Deep Transfer Learning for Forest Mapping and Satellite Image. I have published this paper with my colleagues Sudipan Saha, Muhammad Shahzad, Muhammad Mozum Faraz, and Siao Siang Zhu. Me and my colleagues would like to thank the German Exchange Service DAD for funding this project. Here is a brief outline for this presentation. Let's first start with the motivation behind this paper. Forest mapping, that is the classification and segmentation of forest images in remote sensing, is quite critical to understand deforestation and to fight climate change, which is destroying Earth's natural resources at a rapid rate and can cause serious problems to the ecological system that we live in. Forest mapping can help us build change management systems that can be used to analyze changes in forest areas over the years and help us identify the root causes behind deforestation. There are multiple reasons why forest annotation is not straightforward and requires domain expertise. Forest images as shown here show very high spectral resemblance to non-forest images. Although most of, both of these images look like they belong to the forest M class, that is indeed not the case here. Moreover, even the forest images in general have large intraclass variation, meaning the difference between different forest types is quite large. That brings us to our problem statement. That is, the annotation of forest images requires domain expertise and thus impedes acquisition of such large-scale datasets. This means we can simply annotate images, especially on a large scale of millions of images, and thus this requires an automated system that can annotate forest images and help us understand and tackle deforestation in a much better way. Keeping this in mind, we propose a combined transfer learning and unsupervised learning paradigm that learns to classify forest images progressively. The solution starts with initializing a base convolutional neural network and then fine tunes the model either using a one shot semi supervised learning algorithm with the help of k nearest neighbors or a completely unsupervised algorithm that uses clustering to assign labels. Now, coming to the algorithm, we start from our label dataset which serves as an initializing dataset. We initialize our model using this label dataset. This is known as our relevant base model or simply base model without any adaptations or fine tuning. Next part is extracting features from the labeled as well as the unlabeled dataset in the case of semi supervised learning. This gives us the feature maps that we can see here. These feature maps are shown here after the last max pooling layer. Now we need to assign pseudo labels for the fine tuning process. In case of semi supervised learning, 
we used k nearest neighbors for this we assign the label of the closest images just in the labeled data set to the unlabeled image in the extracted feature space. We apply certain heuristics to make sure that the assigned labels are robust and reliable. We then use these pseudo labels and the unlabeled images along with the labeled data set to fine tune the model until the model converges. Now, in case of unsupervised learning, we just extract the features from the unlabeled data set and apply clustering to separate them into two separate clusters, namely forest and non forest. The pseudo labels are the cluster assignments given by the clustering algorithm. We choose the images that are closest to the cluster center as to result in more robust and reliable pseudo labels. Only these images and not the label data set is used to further fine tune the model until convergence, which is when the reliable image set doesn't change in subsequent iteration. Note that in each subsequent iteration, for both semi-supervised and unsupervised learning, we are using the updated CNN model. This means that the features extracted after each iteration will be more useful, resulting in quite robust and reliable pseudo labels as we move on. Using this algorithm, we have come up with a pro progressive unsupervised deep learning algorithm that learns the deep representations of the images to classify them in an unsupervised manner. Let's now discuss how we make sure that we choose the most reliable and robust images during each iteration. When we start the process of acquiring the pseudo labels, whether in semi-supervised learning or unsupervised learning, not all the labeled uh, unlabeled images are given the absolutely correct pseudo labels, because if that were the case, then there would be no need to fine tune the model. We have applied certain heuristic to make sure we select the most reliable pseudo labels, so the model becomes more powerful with each iteration. In case of unsupervised learning, there will be some wrong cluster assignments at the start as the features extracted, extracted at that moment are in the most useful ones. To make sure we select the right cluster assignments, we select only those images whose cosine similarity with their cluster centroid is above a certain threshold. We may not be sure about all the images in a cluster belonging to that particular class, but the images closest to the cluster centroid have a much bigger chance of belonging to that class. In case of semi-supervised learning, there might be some wrong assignments as shown here. Although the unlabeled image is closest to forest, it will still be labeled as non-forest when we use k nearest neighbors with k is equal to 3. To tackle this, we calculate the distance between the unlabeled image and the, its closest labeled images. The images are with the lowest distance are selected as the reliable images. In each subsequent iteration, the images are increased using an enlarging factor. Here m t and m t minus 1 are the number of images selected in t and t minus 1 iterations respectively. P is the enlarging factor by which we increase the images and N is the number of, number of uh, total unlabeled images. P must be greater than 0 and lower than 1. Here is a summarized pseudo code for our algorithm. We start with the inputs which is unlabeled images and the labeled images. The number of clusters are K which is equal to 2 in our case for S and non-forest in our base model. A threshold for computing the uh, distance uh, so that for creating the reliable pseudo uh, reliable images in case of unsupervised learning and enlarging factor p, which is used to increase the images uh, reliable images in case of uh, semi supervised learning. The output will be our final fine tuned model. We initialize the model on the relevant base data set and we continue with the iteration until the model is not converged. We uh, extract the features from the labeled and the unlabeled data set and we initialize our reliable set to empty. If the labels are available, that is, we are conducting semi-supervised learning, we update the iterations and apply k and n, k nearest neighbors to and also will create the distance between the labeled and unlabeled images. We choose the M top empty levels, uh, top samples having minimum distance between the labeled and unlabeled images. So uh, we combine those chosen samples along with the labeled data set so that this will be our final reliable data set that we will find in our model on. We update our empty using the, this formula. But if we are using unsupervised learning, that is, this, we don't have any labeled data set, we apply clustering and then we do the reliable selection in which we can create the cosine similarity between the features and the cluster centroids and if it is over the threshold, the images are appended to a reliable set. Then we find in the model um, on this model using these reliable set in both the cases of semi-supervised and unsupervised learning. This, this, these iterations are conducted until the model is not converged. Until the model is converged. Now, let me present the data sets that we used. For labeled or relevant based data sets, bigger, we used bigger net data set, which consists of 590,326 images divided into 43 land code classes are labeled and these images are labeled multi-class. Out of these, three belong to forest 
namely mixed forest, coniferous forest, and broadleaf forest. These images are captured by the Sentinel-2 satellite. As our work is focused on the binary classification of forest regions, we select the images belonging to only forest classes and non-forest classes. This resulted in a data set of 59,701 images which are divided into 29,701 forest and 30,000 non-forest images respectively. For the unlabeled data set, Euroset was used which contained 27,000 images divided into 10 land cover classes, one of which is forest. These images were also captured by the Sentinel-2 data set. For binary forest classification, we use the resulting data set of 5,970 images out of which 3,000 were forest and 2,970 images were non-forest, which were divided uniformly within the other nine classes. We experimented our model with different spectral modalities, that is RGB, RGB plus near infrared and five vegetation indices. The reason for using vegetation indices was that as they are proven to provide us with more information about forest features in a remote sensing image rather than raw pixels, we believed our model would be able to perform better, than use, better when using vegetation indices, which indeed was the case. Now coming to the results. We started by testing our model, that is our base model, which was initialized on BigEarthNet on the unlabeled data set, which, is, which in our case was Euroset, without any fine tuning. This was done to get a baseline of score that we expect our model to perform better than after fine tuning. Then we report the results by our model after semi supervised learning, which resulted in an increase using all spectral modalities. In the case of unsupervised learning, a similar trend was noticed as the results, results improved every time. Supervised results were also reported as an upper bound, and our models seemed to see, approach these results. The results were expected as semi supervised uh, performed slightly better than unsupervised while vegetation indices perform the best among the spectral modalities. There are some points of, for discussion here. Let's start with the reason behind choosing a shallow three convolutional layer network instead of for instant ResNet or something similar. We did try with these models and although the base model results were quite similar, these models didn't seem to fine tune well. The reason behind this is that as explained before, the reliable images in the star are quite low in these deep architectures architectures seem to overfit on them and fail to generalize well. Second, why use a relevant base model trained on a relevant data set and not a model initialized on, for instance, ImageNet? The reason behind this is that there is a lot of difference between the features of remote sensing of remote sensing images and normal world images, and the pre-trained models are unable to capture these differences for remote sensing images. This required initializing the model on a relevant base data set. There are also some hyperparameters worth discussing in the case of semi-supervised learning. Multiple values for k in KNN were experimented and k is equal to 3 resulted in the best scores. As k is equal to 1 included information about only one labeled image which wasn't always accurate and k is equal to 3 k is equal to 5 resulted in a lot of unnecessary information. The second was the enlarging factor. The enlarging factor was set to 0.1 here as setting it to quite high resulted in a rapid convergence resulting in which resulted in the pseudo labels not being robust or reliable enough. Setting it to quite low resulted in a very large computation time as the number of reliable images increased quite slowly. With this let's conclude our presentation. We present a progressive unsupervised deep learning algorithm based approach for forest mapping. One of the benefits of this approach is that it is quite generic and can be applied to other areas as well. The results reported were quite reliable as three different spectral modalities were included. Some improvements could be incorporation of textural semantics of forests and using uh, other clustering techniques rather than k-means which can result in a much more generic algorithm which may not need a relevant base at all. And thank you all for listening to, my, to our presentation. Have a nice day. for the presentation from Mohan. Are there any questions?
Uh, I have one question. How do you choose the parameter uh, in the uh, KNN? Sorry? Uh, how to choose the hyperparameter in the KNN? The main, uh, we experimented with, as I explained, with uh, multiple values for the uh, K and KNN. But the, uh, when we uh, chose, for example, one, we chose uh, K is equal to three, but when we chose K is equal to one, the uh, uh, it was only using one la labeled image, but the information from that label image was not always correct because the data sets, the unlabeled and labeled image were different data sets. And K is equal to five was basically including a lot of unnecessary information that we didn't need. So K is equal to three produced the best results on the development set. So we chose that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the next section is uh, uh, the presentation of LUAI challenge results on the uh, was. Uh, the presentation is uh, uh, by uh, um, Professor uh, Lan Xue. As well, come. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm honored to introduce the LUI challenges in conjunction with ICC with uh, 2021. And uh, so let's jump to, to the uh, challenge detail. Uh, to advance methods for. Uh, for uh, to, I don't know. Uh, okay. uh, let, let me. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Channel.
Okay, so uh, sorry for the uh, for that, and uh, let's continue. Um, and, uh, to advance methods for learning to understand area images, we propose a challenge consists of three tasks. The task one and two are object detection for oriented bounding box detection and the horizontal bounding box detection. And for the task three, we propose a semantic segmentation task. And uh, the, the, uh, we use Delta V2 for object detection, which has uh, about two, one million instances in the challenge, uh, challenge test challenge set. For GID 15, <coughs> we use it uh, for uh, semantic segmentation and uh, each image is very large, about uh, uh, 6,000 uh, times uh, <coughs> uh, 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 7,000 pixels. And for task one, uh, the, our target is to output uh, the rotated bounding box uh, with score and the visual evaluation, uh, mean average precision as our evaluation metric. Uh, similar to task one, and we also use uh, MAP for evaluation, but uh, uh, the <coughs> task uh, requires to output horizontal bounding boxes from area images. For the task three, we uh, expect outputs are uh, uh, semantic label images that uh, predict uh, should predict uh, every semantic label in, uh, in each uh, semantic label in each pixel, and uh, we use the mean IOU as uh, our evaluation metric. And uh, <laughs> overall, we received uh, about uh, one hundred and fifteen registrations for those three tasks and uh, um, all the registration contributed about 1,000 submissions for the three tasks. Uh, in the next, let me introduce the results. Uh, first, for the task one of rotated object detection, uh, the Alibaba Group and the Tsinghua University and the High Vision Research Institute won the uh, uh, top three places. And uh, for the task two, uh, uh, Alibaba, uh, the group uh, Alibaba AIRS uh, won the first place and the uh, High Cow. Uh, from High Vision Research Institute that got the second place and the Tsinghua CC from Tsinghua University got the third place. For the sim task of semantic segmentation, the Alibaba AIRS uh, team from Alibaba Group also won the first place and uh, the teams ZIZ and the Group for it from Xinjiang University uh, got the second and third place respect activity. Yeah, here is a leaderboard for <coughs> task one and the task two and task three. Okay, uh, after uh, the challenge, we summarize the methods uh, uh, from the uh, 1,000 submissions and we found that firstly, uh, I, for object detection, our I transformer and the redates are widely used uh, frameworks. And uh, uh, secondly, the transformer-based backbones have shown great potentials in the LUI challenges for all three tasks. And uh, lastly, SWA is another widely used method in all three tasks to improve the generalization ability. So uh, <coughs> we wrote uh, uh, a technical report uh, with all the Mm, authors from uh, workshop organizer and uh, uh, challenge uh, the top three challenge teams. So for more details, please see our technical report on the archive. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your attendance to our work workshop and uh, you can scan the QR code and, uh, uh, to get the detail for our workshop and the technical report. Uh, report for our uh, area challenge results. Thank you. Is the recording going to be uploaded to the website? Uh, or on the yes. ICC? Okay.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending our workshop. And uh, I think we have um, got a lot of helpful information from three professors and uh, uh, thanks for all of uh, presentations. And we also thank all uh, attendees for our LUI challenges. And I think uh, we, we have successfully uh, heard that host of the uh, workshop. And, uh, it's time to say goodbye. Hmm. Okay.